to call to order the May 26, 2015 Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Uh, the first order of business will be to approve the April 28, 2015 minutes. Anybody like to make a motion? I'll move to approve the minutes of April 28th Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Any discussion regarding these minutes? All in favor? All right, six nothing approved. Uh, moving on to the next order of business, which is old business, and there is none. Um, so we'll move on to <laughs> the new business. Uh, the first order of new business is to hear the request of Andrew and Daniel Courier, who reside at 17 Ocean View Road, Map U3, Lot 77, to add a second story to their house based on Section 9-4-3B3 of the Zoning Ordinance. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Courier? Hi. Hi. So uh, my name is Andrew Courier. I live at 17 Ocean View Road. This is my wife, Danielle. Um, and as you mentioned, we're here to request uh, approval of a, an addition that we would like to build on our home. Um, so uh, I thought I would just sort of describe where we live and the lot a little bit um, and, um, and then talk about the specifics of what we would like to do. Um, so first of all, we live in a, in a rather small home uh, in the neighborhood. Um, the 13 lots that are in the immediate vicinity of our house um, all have homes. All but two of those are homes that are over 2,000 square feet. Um, our house is 1,100 square feet, um, and we would like to build an addition which would add 650 square feet to that. Um, we have a, a growing family, two young children um, who uh, every day are uh, increasingly bouncing off the walls and uh, need more space. <laughs> and um, this, uh, I knew this would happen, but I thought it maybe it would take another year or two, and, and here we are. <laughs> um, and so we need to, to do something. And this is what we, we would like to do because we truly love where we live. So as I mentioned, uh, we'd like to, to build a, a rather modest addition on our 1,100 square foot home. The addition would go up and add a total of five feet, seven inches of height to the house. Um, so that would be a half story. We already have an attic story on our house, so we're essentially just adding just enough vertical height to make that attic story livable. Um, this project would only add height to our house, and it would not go out from the footprint of the house in any way. Um, Right now, the footprint of our house is situated very far back from the front of our lot, about 56 feet. There is a very small area of overlap between our house and the adjacent house at 19 Ocean View. There are four feet where our houses overlap, so you can actually measure across to see how close they are. And that distance between the foundations is seven feet, six inches. So we're fairly close. But being so close is one of the things that we love about this neighborhood. We love the fact that our kids can play and run through the yard and that there's sort of, as there's, there's actually a sign uh, posted in our neighborhood that says free range children, which is kind of exactly the philosophy. So we, we would very much love to stay. We believe that um, this, this addition is modest. Again, it keeps the existing footprint of the house. Um, and it is really the minimal addition that we can um, apply and uh, and have the space that, that we need to stay in the neighborhood that we love. Um, Andrew took my part, so now I don't have much to say. But um, I don't think you mentioned the interior finished um, square feet of the uh, second floor would be about 650 square feet. So that would give us a total of um, 1750 for square feet of the, of the whole home. Um, and that's everything, I think. Questions? Questions? 
Any questions at this time? Can you talk a little bit, um, and I know it was addressed in your letter to some extent in the history, but can you just refresh my recollection on how you ended up applying for this permit under 1943B3, the kind of reconstruction and relocation piece? Yes, can. Um, when we first started thinking about um, the project, my first uh, course of action was to call the town. Um, and I spoke with Ben and said, what do I need to do? This is what we're interested in doing. Um, what's the process? And um, he said, well, you can come in. We're going to have you fill out an application. Um, you submit it to the zoning board, and it'll be reviewed at a meeting, uh, appeals meeting. So, so I said, OK. So I went in. I got the um, application that you have in front of you. Ben and I went over um, what needed to be included in the application, what would be helpful for all of you to hear. Um, we took it home. We started filling it out. And then, um, to be honest, maybe the cart came before the horse, but I sent Ben an email later and said, um, what exactly am I applying under? <laughs> uh, because I wasn't too familiar with the ordinances myself. Um, and he sent me an email, which um, basically told me that this was the ordinance I needed to pursue. Um, I have the email actually here. Um, it says the section of the zoning is 1943B3. Um, and then he attached um, the ordinance for my reference and highlighted the section. So I said, OK. And we proceeded from there. Yes, I'll ask a question. On the, um, the rear property line, there's a, a row of trees in one of the photographs. Is that on your property, or is that on the property behind you? Um, I believe that is on the property behind us, that row of hemlocks. On the north side? Yeah. Yes. What, what do you think the distance between that property line and your structure, not, um, not the walkway about, of the foundation? Yes, uh, it's about three feet, six inches from the property line. But I would add that the distance, the distance, this is the adjacent structure on that lot is about 34 feet. Any other questions for the couriers at this time? Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or concerns? Good evening, board members. My name is Mary Costigan. I'm an attorney with Bernstein Shore, and I'm here tonight on behalf of two of the neighbors um, right next door, Mark Abbott and Rebecca Block. I'm going to talk about a, a, just a threshold legal issue with regard to the application, and then Mark and Rebecca will come up and, and talk about their property and the impact of this project on their property. Um, I submitted a letter that I hope you have all seen. Um, it's dated May 22nd. Um, we are concerned that this application is being reviewed un under the wrong section of the ordinance. This is an undersized lot with an existing principal structure. And when you have that, there is a very specific provision of the ordinance that applies. Um, it is section 19-4-3A2A. Um, and it 
it does give some relief for buildings that are located on undersized lots and it does allow them to enlarge and it gives them some relief from the setbacks of their zone but even with that relief the couriers cannot meet the setbacks um, they're relieved from 20 feet to 10 feet to the side and a 15 foot rear um, and as you've seen it's much much closer than that to the side and to the rear um, and because of that they actually should be applying for a variance as opposed to applying under a much more um, less stringent standard of a reconstruction the section they're applying for um, applies to a circumstance where a house is destroyed or otherwise needs to be replaced or repaired and is located within the setback and that's just not what we're dealing with here we're dealing with an enlargement of a house on an undersized lot um, so we just Ben and I usually agree, but in this case, I, I just respectfully disagree with him, and I think they should be actually applying for a variance. Are they increasing the encroachment, or is the encroachment exactly the same, regardless of whether this addition occurs or not? Is it just a volume increase, or are they going into the setback? They're not getting any closer, Correct. but because they're already within the setback, on an undersized lot that that section applies to them. So you're saying that they need a retroactive variance under this section for encroachments that already exist? Because they, you're no, saying that if there's a change in volume of the encroachment, then it needs to meet those relieved setbacks. Right. You can't increase the volume of an already existing encroachment. Right. What, what, that, what that section says is if you have an undersized lot, which this is, it's only five you know 5700 square feet it's a very small lot it has an existing principal structure and what this allows is for existing principal structures to be enlarged provided that they meet the dimensional requirements in the section above and the section above has different dimensional requirements for those types of lots than you find in later on under the districts. So these lots and these houses do get some relief. They're given a, instead of a 20 foot setback, they have a 15 foot to the rear and 10 to the side. And then that section goes on to say, if you can't meet these um, dimensional standards, you then have to go apply for a variance. So that's where that section takes you. It, take, it winds up at a variance. And in the event you determine that the section applies that they're actually applying for, Mark and Rebecca are going to come up now to talk about um, under that section you consider views, you consider uh, location of the structures on adjacent lots. So they're going to come and talk about that. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mark Abbott, and I live at 19 Ocean View. And before I give my statement, I had a couple of documents I wanted to share with the board. So I don't know, can I just give those to you now? Um, um, they won't become part of the record. Yeah, that's fine. They're just they're, they're visual aids and so on. So the, the first one is a statement from the three adjacent neighbors just saying that, that uh, as a group, we don't agree. And the second one is specifically from, from Rebecca and I at 19 Ocean View. Okay, thank you. So we're here tonight to express our strong objections to the project that our neighbors are proposing to expand their home at 17 Ocean View Road. 17 Ocean View is a great house. In our opinion, it's perfectly designed for its site, its location, and its neighborhood. And it would be a shame to make such a drastic change to it. But of course, that's not why we're objecting. Instead, we're really worried about the negative effects 
that this project would have on our own life and home. Number 17 was built just a few feet away from 19 because it was initially a guest house with both houses built on a single property. In fact, it is hard to convey from photographs just how extremely close our two houses are. Our backyard runs straight up to the shingles on their west wall, as their front yard does to our east wall. Wall to wall, the houses are less than eight feet apart, and the roof lines are less than four feet apart. The 36 inches of setback that we have on paper is basically just a convenience to allow each homeowner the ability to walk all the way around the property. We are truly living cheek by jowl. The proposed expansion would drastically affect our backyard. Being to the north of the house, it gets limited sunlight as it is. Adding height to our eastward neighbor would throw nearly the entire yard into shadow. While our front yard is largely a public space where the neighborhood kids play and swing and climb, the backyard is for us. It's where we enjoy a cup of coffee in the morning or grill hamburgers in the evening. The proposed change would greatly diminish this space. Our views are also at risk. Today, we have wonderful views from our second floor. We see the water, we see trees, we see the islands. Those views will all be gone. From my office on the third floor, I look out and I see the bikers and joggers on Shore Road. The proposed expansion would take that away too. The very name of our street, Ocean View Road, would no longer be true for us. Finally, we are greatly concerned about our privacy. Number 17 today has close and direct visibility into our lower windows, but that's on the first floor, the largely public areas of our house. The proposed expansion would add windows which would not only tower over our yard, but which would provide a close, direct, and unobstructed view into our bedrooms and bathrooms. We love our house and our neighborhood, but frankly, we would not have bought number 19 if it had had a two-story house literally within reach of it. Please don't force this unneeded and disruptive change on our neighborhood and our home. Thank you very much for your consideration and your attention. Any other public comment? Hi, I'm Rebecca Block. Um, I was just going to talk you through some of these pictures in the packet to orient you. The first page really just shows the proximity of the two houses. You can see where the roof line are less than four feet apart. The same thing is true on the second page. It really just shows how close these two houses are. The third page shows our property line in orange, so you can see our backyard and then the property line that goes basically right up to 36 inches from their house so that people can walk around their house. The next two pages are how the sunlight would change in our backyard with the proposed increase in height. On the following page on the upper left you can see that's a view from one of our rooms on the first floor directly into 17 Ocean View. That's their dining room window. So you can imagine if someone's in that either window that it's a pretty close view. And the following three photos just show where those dormers of the proposed addition would overlook our master bedroom, our master bathroom, and our son's room. Then I have just some pictures of the, the views that would change. So you can see from the third floor where we have some water view and shore road views that would be obstructed by the higher roof. And then the second floor views. I didn't include views from every window in the house because they get quite repetitive. So um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about why I'm opposed to this idea. Um, in general, I'm really a conflict-averse person. I've never opposed to any project proposed by my neighbors, and I love living in a neighborhood where the houses are close. I really do. Um, to help you understand, though, why we're opposing this, I want to go through a little bit of the history of the houses. Many years ago, this property was divided into two single residences, 
um, but it was originally built by one man as a house and a guest house, so they were built in very close proximity. Um, the property line now zigzags between the two properties in order to allow spaces for steps and for entryways. As you can see on that picture, it has to kind of zigzag so that you can give some space to each property. Um, this explains why the houses are so close to each other, but the property lines um, were originally built uh, as one lot, so the property line zigzags in a way that you wouldn't see if a house were built originally on two separate lots. I've included pictures in the packet to show just how close number 17 Ocean View is to our property line in our house. Um, although the distance between the two houses is listed in their permit proposal as eight feet, the actual distance to the setback is 36 inches and less than that if you take into account the roof line. Although these two houses were built very close to one another, there was significant planning to make this less noticeable. And one of the features you'll notice in some of the pictures is that the roof line on number 17 exactly lines up with the roof line from the first floor on number 19 on that where they meet. Um, some of the pictures show that. An increase in the height of even 5 feet 7 inches I think would have a much more significant aesthetic impact on both houses because the symmetry would be lost. The enlargement would also have significant effects on our daily life. All of the views from the north and east facing windows that now show sky skyline would be obscured by a taller house that's only 36 inches from our property line. The proposed increase in building height would also reduce the sunlight in our backyard. We've included a projected sketch um, in the packets. Our yard has been landscaped with plants appropriate for the current amount of shade and sunlight. And any change to that would not only decrease our enjoyment of our yard, but also likely threaten many of our plantings. <laughs> Another significant impact would be the proposed, um, would be a loss of personal privacy. Currently, although we're quite close, the two houses only share views of each other's common living spaces, kitchens, living rooms, and dining areas. The two houses are quite close together, and if someone is in one of these areas, I can attest that there is very little privacy. That really hasn't been an issue as it is on the first floors. However, a second floor in the proposed dormer windows would have views that are quite close that include our master bedroom, our son's bedroom, and our two bathrooms on the second floor. Those are areas in which I don't want to worry about a neighbor's view, and yet I also don't want to have to hide behind closed shades in my own house. With the loss of aesthetic appeal, effects on sunlight in our backyard, and loss of privacy, we believe the effects of this enlargement would significantly decrease the value of our home had this been the case, when we were shopping for a home, we would not have purchased this property. Although we, we do sympathize with the needs of a growing family to have more space, we don't believe that it should come at the cost of our views, our property value, and our privacy. That's why I respectfully ask that the board deny this permit. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Good evening. Uh, my name is David Simino. I live at 12 Island View Road, which is the home directly behind um, 17 Ocean. Uh, I'd like to comment about two items. Uh, one is an earlier question about the trees that were located um, behind the home. Um, they, they, those trees are on my property, and I think that the application somewhat, if un probably unintentionally, but kind of inaccurately shows um, how close their, their home is actually to our garage and the property line. Um, the survey doesn't really adequately give a dimension from their home to the property line. And uh, on a part of their application, it shows the dimension between the, their home and the garage is three foot six inches, but when in reality, if you take into account the overhangs of both structures, it's more like 20 to 24 inches. Um, and if you give the benefit of the doubt that maybe the property line is somewhere in that area, 
the distance from their house to the property line is more like in a matter of inches than three foot six feet. Um, my other concern is that um, during construction, <clears throat> I would be concerned that the trees would be damaged in some way, being so close to the edge of the property. And there are such mature trees that replacing a damaged one uh, wouldn't really be an adequate solution. The, the trees just now, this year, um, shield both of our houses from each other. And um, they're probably 20 plus feet tall. And if one were to get damaged enough where it would be injured and die, replacing it, you wouldn't be able to get a 20 foot tall tree to replace with. Um, I've been a general contractor for about uh, 18 years now, and there doesn't, in my mind, building an addition that close to those trees doesn't seem like it would be possible to do without um, causing some relatively significant damage to them. So for those reasons, I hope you consider um, not approving this application. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hello, good evening. My name is Tim Soley. I live at 644 Shore Road. I'm not an immediate abutter, but I've lived in the neighborhood now for 22 years. And, and uh, the neighborhood being Mountain View Park, I, I'd like to say that I think the character of a neighborhood that's nearly a century old, that has created a, a lovely neighborhood that we've raised two children in, is predicated upon very specific you know, parameters, things like uh, lot size, uh, setbacks, and the incidents that brought this, you know, this situation forward, which were you know, uh, uh, someone building an additional guest home on their own property, um, were, were quite uh, reasonable in that condition. The allowance to separate those two into uh, two separate uh, um, freestanding uh, properties would not be allowed today, I don't think. And I think, uh, as Mr. Courier himself said, that the, his, you know, their house is a small house, and I think it was done for a very specific reason. It was done so that that additional uh, original guest house would set in a way that, that was harmonious in, in, in the, uh, you know, in, on that lot. I think, Mr. Andrew, I think you mentioned that, uh, you know, you were, you were asked the question about uh, footprint. When I think about the footprint, you know, uh, the footprint is three-dimensional. The footprint is not only uh, in plan or two dimensions, but also it's in three dimensions. So if a house is allowed to remain within its footprint. If it exceeds the elevation footprint, at that point, it's imposing further on its neighborhood. And I think the expectations that one has when one moves into a neighborhood like this are very explicit in terms of the character defining features of what makes that neighborhood. And I think changing those expectations is very, is very dangerous to, to the very urban fabric of that neighborhood. So I would like to say that I oppose you know, the expansion of the house at uh, 17 Island View Road, uh, Ocean View Road. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Um, any rebuttal from the couriers? Any further comments? Um, I guess we both have um, our own little pieces to add. Um, I was going to address more specifically the ordinances. Um, but I just, while it's fresh in my mind, um, wanted to mention that the fact is that they are two lots today and have been for a while on and off. Our home and property has been owned by um, 15 Ocean View Road, which a neighbor who lives across the street for 30 years in the neighborhood was able to give us a little of that history. And over the time that they've been there, that house has been a rental on and off with people coming and going on a yearly basis. Um, there have been times when the house was used strictly as a summer home for out-of-staters. Um, and I think that actually we would add to the neighborhood um, in the stability of the neighborhood by having a home that can support uh, a, a family um, with uh, two kids. And 
it's a home that still will be very modest at 1750 square uh, 1750 square feet um, still much smaller than most of the homes in the neighborhood as far as the ordinance is concerned um, just to reiterate that uh, we were pointed in the direction of the section B by the town and the code enforcement officer our understanding and having some conversations later was that that ordinance was specifically chosen for the language that it uses it speaks specifically to non-conforming buildings and structures, whereas Ordinance A speaks um, more to non-conforming lots. Um, the other piece was that if we look at Ordinance um, A, and it talks about having to get a variance for um, side and rear setbacks, um, the difference here, as we mentioned, is that we're staying on the existing um, footprint we're only doing a vertical modification um, that vertical modification doesn't break uh, the 35 foot rule um, would be about 30 feet that wouldn't require um, a variance um, as we wouldn't be violating any height uh, we would not be encroaching any further on um, the nonconformity that already exists in our home um, the other piece we just wanted to mention was that, um, in fact, uh, 15, uh, I may have said the wrong address earlier, but my apologies, 15 Ocean um, View Road uh, in 2008 obtained two building permits without a ZABA approval or variance. Um, the one permit was for permission to do renovations, add dormers, and finish attic space. The other permit, which I have photocopies here, is for construction of a 6 by 22 story addition, and it didn't require um, uh, ZABA approval um, or variance. So I guess that's speaking more directly to the uh, ordinances. And Andrew has a few things to add as well. I guess I just wanted to speak to some of the individual uh, points that were raised uh, by Mark and Becca. Um, who we've loved having as our neighbors over these past six years, and um, and I would hope that whatever happens, that um, we you know maintain a, a cordial relationship. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was um, the condition of light in the lot. Um, I believe Mark said that uh, the change uh, would throw their entire yard into shadow. Um, so I, I, I took some pictures and I also did some renderings. I actually used to be an architectural designer. Um, so I did a full CAD model of both houses, um, and I applied a heliothorpe for this latitude and longitude for April 22nd to show the exact lines of the shadows in the lot. And these are corroborated by photographs that we took. So you can see how the renderings and the photographs line up. So I thought I would just show you that. Shadow. 
212, and then by 4 o'clock, the shadows are pointing in this direction. Um, the red, you can see a little red here, and it's hard to see. That actually shows what the difference would be with the addition. The red is what, how, how much the shadow would grow with the addition. So as you can see, we grow very, very little. At this time of day, 18, there's a tiny little sliver. By 10, 11, again, very little. And then there's zero influence at 12.04, 2.12, and 4 o'clock p.m. The, and the reason for that is just that our house sits northeast to their yard. So just by the tracking of the sun, the very fact that our home sits northeast means that the effect will be minimized. Um, as for the views, um, that's tough. That's a subjective sort of a thing in some ways because we're very far from the ocean. We're about a thousand feet from the ocean. There are many trees and houses between our lots and the ocean that already obstruct the vast majority of any ocean view. And in fact, I got up on a ladder and took some photos from Greg. I was, I was curious. I wanted to know what is this view that is being obstructed? And all I saw were trees. I didn't see any ocean. Horizon. I, I saw trees on the horizon. I saw, I, was, I, saw, I saw some of the islands, but I actually didn't see any ocean. And this was in, in April, so that was before the leaves came in. There were maybe just a few buds on the trees. Um, loss of aesthetic appeal, that's something that I, I care very deeply about. I, I truly love our house, and I would like to think that our plans honor the architect who came up with those plans and that he would enjoy them, that he would appreciate them. Um, again, I just, I couldn't help it, but I brought up, I went to the hardware store and I got a dowel and I cut it. So this is 5 feet 7 inches. This is the amount of height that we could add to our house. Just enough to make the edit a finish in this place. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we have one. Any further questions for the curves? I had a quick question. Sure. Um, are there, do you know how long ago it was that these properties were divided? Was it in the last couple of years? I don't know that for sure. I know we bought it from a family that had two kids that moved out, and I believe they had been there for about four years. Actually, if I can, you know what? Um, I printed up a letter that my, I, I don't know if it has it exactly in it, but um, the letter from the neighbor who uh, mentioned the history of it. Is it the felon letter? Uh, um, Van, Van Fleet. Fleet. No, I'm not. Um, no, I, I don't see any specifics. Like I said, I, I know the family we bought it from. It was not a rental; they had purchased it, and I, I believe they were there for about um, four years. I mean, the the history of the neighborhood is such that they're all non-conforming lots in that zone. Um, with additions, modifications, improvements being made throughout the last hundred years. Actually, there are a couple more things I want to raise, and I promise we'll be quiet. <laughs> um, one thing is, uh, we've spoken to a contractor oh, the trees. Uh, who assures us that there will be no damage to the trees at all. Well, you wouldn't have to remove them. I'm not, I can't Sorry. guarantee that a branch wouldn't fall off, but, but he, he, we, he's confident that <laughs> they wouldn't have to remove. I confirmed with him no vegetation would need to be removed in order to do the do the addition. Again, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any public comment rebuttal? Hey folks, just a few points. I know uh, we don't want to be here all night, but I, I did want to address uh, the comments about the character of the neighborhood and the concerns that if this house is not changed, we'll just have you know transients and renters and so on. That has not been the case in the past, and trust me, as the immediate neighbors of this property, it's not a concern for us. Uh, this house typically um, houses a young family for several years until they outgrow it. 
uh, when we had our house in Portland, uh, we lived in a wonderful house, and uh, when we outgrew that house, unfortunately, we had to move, which, which we did. Uh, and that's what happens typically to this house, so we're not concerned about uh, the character of the neighborhood being negatively affected by leaving it as is. Um, there was a brief point about 15 Ocean View Road, not needing a variance for their change. Uh, so it wasn't about a variance, they actually had to buy property from, uh, their, neighbor, uh, from their immediate neighbor in order to make that change. So they, they, there was a requirement there. They, uh, so they weren't able to just go in and make this change without any, uh, without any action on their part. I uh, wanted to speak about this the point about sunlight. So I've never been an architectural designer. Um, I use Google SketchUp to make the renderings that you see in there, and the, I think they're a bit crude. You can pick any date in the calendar, and you'll get different, uh, different perspectives for, for sunlight, obviously. Uh, I pick Family Fun Day uh, because that's the day when uh, we, we have, often have a lot of people in our yard. Uh, it's a big, a big day for the neighborhood, and I wanted to show something that seemed representative to me. So. That's the date I picked, and, and you can see um, that there is a significant impact on our light. Um, again, the views also, uh, uh, Andrew stated that those are subjective. I don't think it is subjective. You have the uh, photographs in your packet showing what the views are today. Uh, I assure you, we can see ocean from our house at the moment, um, and you can see that those views will be, uh, will be diminished and lost. Uh, okay, thank you, that's all I have. Thank you. Can I ask you a quick question? Please. Do you know how long the properties have been separated? So I don't know for sure. I, I know uh, that the previous owner, uh, it was a few owners back. Rebecca, do you know? Yeah, I actually spoke to, I thought it was 1986 when um, Something wrong. two owners back of our house. Um, but when we actually contacted someone before, they thought it was even before that. But it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. And there's, you're not aware of any deed restrictions on your property or theirs when that conveyance was made saying it shall re forever remain as is? No. I, I do have a couple quick questions for you, Mr. Edward. Um, how long have you lived in this particular property? Uh, for 10 years. About 10 years. And, and have you uh, had any uh, reconstruction or enlargement or addition while you lived there? We have not had any enlargements. Yeah. Yeah. No construction at all. We, we've we've redone our kitchen. Yeah. Nothing on the outside. The the uh, back porch has been enclosed to make it more of a of a mudroom, but that's again that was within the existing structure. So that it was enclosed to do what? I'm sorry. I didn't hear uh, oh, to to make it into like a mudroom. Uh, mm -hmm. So so that again we had this existing porch and we just sort of enclosed it to make it kind of an indoor outdoor okay. type space. With the existing roof. And With the existing roof. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? All right. There no further public comment. We'll close public comment. Uh, board discussion. Obviously, we first have to decide what uh, section of the ordinance applies. Um, I think we've applied 1943B3 before in very similar circumstances. I can't specifically remember the applications, but I, that I, house I on know the corner of Ocean and um, right by Maxwell's farm, that blue house yes. on the corner. Yeah, where where the reconstruction thing. Yeah. added square footage to the inside of the structure, but didn't change the um, the footprint. To me, this fits into that situation. I mean, I, but obviously, that, that's my initial inclination. I don't, I don't, I haven't heard anything that really changes my view that, similar to the applications that have been before the board, 1943B3 applies. I mean, obviously, there's, you know, there's a different situation with respect to the surrounding houses, but you don't really get to that if 1943B3 applies. At least that's my initial take. Don't all speak at once. I think we had a similar situation down by um, two lights also. But in both of those situations, there was no um, opposition. Right. 
I mean, that's true. I mean, there, there, there is opposition now, but I, I'm loath to change our interpretation of the ordinance. It, the ordinance is the ordinance, and that's how we've held in the past. Of the two applications that you're talking about in the past, do you recall any further details about those? Do you know what the property was? It was a similar situation where there was an increase in volume that did not decrease, did, that did not further decrease the existing setback issue. It was a change to an existing non-conforming structure that stayed within the existing non-conforming setbacks. Okay. And if I remember correctly, it, it was, the footprint was actually enlarging, but not into a non-conforming non set. Yeah, not into non-conforming wasn't increasing the nonconformity. Exactly. And that said, I think even if we were to look at the section cited by Attorney Costigan, I think that applying the setback, the reduced setbacks to a upper addition while they don't apply to the underlying structure, doesn't make any sense to begin with and seems to apply more to a non-conforming lot issue than it does to a structural issue, which is how that section is, has been applied historically, is on the lot side. And I guess, Dan, I was asking what, what made you turn to 1943B3? Well, I, I do believe it's the proper interpretation of the ordinance, and we, and we have heard several of these. And in my brief tenure here, I, I think we've heard at least five or six of them. Uh, the Clifford property was one of the first ones that we did, and they went from a story and a half to two and a half stories. Uh, they were very close to their property line at the end of Lawson Road. Uh, the Brooking property on two lights. There's, there's been a, there's been several in the past couple of years that have been handled this way, and, and in my opinion, the, you know, the non-conforming lot section it covers some aspects of the lot, and then non-conforming structures goes into more detail about what can be done with the structure. And so I think the non-conforming structure section is more specific. The uh, the section on non-conforming lots is, 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 is intended to be a little more broad-based concerning the lots, and then it gets more specific with non-conforming structures. Uh, in the non-conforming lots section, it also says that relocation has to conform with the standards in the chart, but then non-conforming structures says that you can relocate with this process through the zoning board. So there, there's several problems. With, uh, with that and relying specifically on the non-conforming lots provision that, that I see. It would, it would require every dormer, every dormer that didn't completely meet setbacks would, uh, would need a variance, which is something that's very uncharacteristic. Are we also have the view that if the house God forbid, uh, was destroyed or someone wanted to take it to another lot and, and use it as a home, that, that the new homeowners can build something, the same footprint, up to 35 feet? That's right. So it's just the, the mechanics on how the, work, the, the rules um, work together. Uh, two follow-up points was, how do you address the issue of light and shades, and whether those homeowners have a, a, a right to that. And the second is, is the issue of privacy that was raised. Um, I, I don't, on the, one of the maps here, there's, I think it's to Elizabeth Road, probably has the better view, if that's the proper thing to say, into the back of the house there, whereas the applicant's house is across the yard. Um, or whether there's a right to privacy, where those homes overlook each other so, quite, so close. Cheek to jowl, which was referenced. So, any comment on those two points? I mean, I think there is at least so 1943B3 
refers back to 1943B2 relocation in determining whether the building reconstruction replacement meets the setback to the greatest practical extent. Would we get to that? I mean, I'm just looking at, so, you know, in our draft additional findings, it does include the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, which is language that's taken from 1943B2. Because, I mean, so 1943B3 speaks to um, and the building or the structure will be located with the original building footprint um, will not increase the number of square feet or floor area. Okay, it's going to. So then reconstruction of a non-conforming structure not in compliance with these limitations may be permitted provided that such reconstruction is in compliance with the setback requirements to the greatest practical extent as determined by the Zoning Board of Appeals in accordance with the purpose of this ordinance. In no case shall a structure be reconstructed or replaced so as to increase its nonconformity. It goes on in determining whether the building reconstruction replacement meets the setback to the greatest practical extent. The Zoning Board of Appeals shall consider the physical condition and type of foundation present, if any, in addition to the criteria set forth in 1943B. This says B3 relocation, it should say B2. I think that what we've done historically is to determine that where the addition or expansion is not increasing the nonconformity, therefore it's further away than the existing kind of closeness to the other structure, that that kind of de facto is meeting setbacks to the greatest practical extent because it's not increasing the nonconformity. It's less than the existing structure. I think what Matt said was a little bit different and pretty illustrative in that he has a good point. If this structure were to be removed, you could rebuild it within the existing footprint up to 35 feet, which would be substantially taller than it is right now and then what is being proposed. So what's, what's the language that I, how, how would that, that would just apply based on the footprint? Yeah. So only if the existing foot, if you're rebuilding and the existing footprint is, would cause a problem with respect to other properties? Well, it's within the existing, it's not, it's meeting setbacks to the greatest practical extent because it's within the existing footprint. It's not looking to expand into the non existing nonconformity. So it's not reducing the setbacks. I agree with you that it's unfortunate that the privacy and light issues are not part of our ordinance and the view issues are not part of our ordinance. Yeah, view is cited in that section, but the privacy and sunlight are not. Which is the impact on view. In the context of the setbacks, though. Well, I mean, the, the language in 1943-2 is in determining whether the building relocation meets the setback to the greatest practical extent, the Zoning Board of Appeals shall consider the size of the lot, the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property on adjacent properties location of the septic system, other on-site soil, so septic system, the impact on that's, that's, that's That language is there. Sorry, the, the, that, ref, that provision is talking about a relocation, so you're gonna move the structure to another location. But it, it's... Right? Right, but it's, refer, it's 
1943b3 refers you to that to determine whether or not the replacement meets the step back to the greatest practical extent. So I, I would ask what what could the applicant do to, uh, if it were practical to to build this addition that's going up five and a half feet or whatever, what could they do to meet further meet the setback that or, or say increase the setback that wouldn't impact views? You know what I mean? Almost everything. No matter where this was on that lot, if they're going up five and a half feet, well, I mean, it's going to impact the, the view. The question is, in determining the way So, so I th in my opinion, if we're... If this is solely about, set, I mean, in determining whether the building relocation needs the setback. Right. So that, I think that's what you're saying is, no matter how high... Doesn't matter the where it is. is the, setback, yeah. the setback's not going to change. Yeah. And they can certainly build within the existing setback. Yeah. So what I'm saying is practically, it doesn't matter where this addition is laterally on the lot. If they're going up five and a half feet, it's going to impact views. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, they are doing what they can because there's no other course of action if they want to build this addition that would lessen the impact on views. <laughs> if, you, if you can follow that. With respect to the setback. Correct. And when we're talking about views, what are, we, are we talking about a vista? Are we talking about the view of somebody else's home? Or are we talking about you know, the residential area view? I mean, right. what's, is there a value that we have to put as to the word um, impact on views? Right. Does well, that I, change? I agree. Is that we're uh, talking the about? The applicant, when he said it's subjective, but um, clearly the abutters uh, feel that there's going to be a change to their view out of the upper stories, and it's, it's a detrimental change. But is that change, first of all, I'm not sure there's anything in the record on that. And second of all, if there were, would it be from this existing setback? Or from, it seems to me that the impacts to views are more from how close the houses are to begin with. And they don't, the height issue it's is the not the setback issue. Yeah, I think that, that's what I keep coming back to is, is the language is all in terms of the setback to the greatest practical extent. It's done. It doesn't address other issues with respect to the reconstruction. It's the setback that we're dealing with. And the setback mm -hmm. isn't changing. So, so of course it's meaning that the setback to the greatest practical extent. But it looks like the design of the addition or the expansion has taken into account the privacy and the light because they're only going up five feet, seven inches. They're not going up a full story. Um, in addition, the, there's a shed dormer there where the windows are separately low and they're overlooking directly over the backyard, not pointed toward the existing home next door. Um, so I'm not really sure what kind of privacy impacts it would actually have. And it also, the privacy go, goes both ways. So the, the, the couriers have taken into account the fact there's a, another, another home located X number of feet away from them with those windows also. So, so I, what I think I'm hearing is general consensus that 1943B3 applies. Okay. Um, Somebody like to make a motion, or do we think we need some additional discussion? Um, before we go to the sure. motion section, can we briefly discuss why, 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 or why not a variance would apply or would not apply to this application? Oh, sorry, why a variance would not be the right remedy to deal with a extension or development of this property? 
If we I, required them to use that procedure for a variance, then we would have to do that for every single dormer on an existing non-conforming structure, for any alteration to an existing non-conforming structure, because by definition, many of those won't meet the applicable setbacks, and then will probably not meet the relieved setbacks either, and then we'll have to get a variance. And so the, the ordinance, um, more likely than not, has interpreted that the height requirement at 35 feet is a sufficient uh, requirement for um, building up uh, on a non-conforming lot. Is that, is that what we're looking at? I think that um, 35 foot height limit is generally applicable to everything. Anything, that's right. So I have nothing further. I mean, we, if the other issue that I had is that if we had to um, find a jurisdictional basis, then that's the finding of the facts. That's the 1943B3 then. Do you want to talk about the motion or the issues of findings of fact? Um, we can. You want to alter the findings of fact? Well, I'm thinking that when we just say that, you know, if we go up, it, it's it's not a non-conforming aspect. So. Sorry, if the application is seeking to raise the roof line. Right. That's not increasing the non-conformity of the, of the structure. Correct. With respect to the setback. That's right. Which is what the additional, which is the additional finding of fact two. The proposed structure will not increase the non-conformity. Mm. I, I was thinking that something a little more specific than just that, those words. Because what I'm hearing is that something that we've talked about tonight, um, it, I know at least one of those prior applications, and we had a, um, a non-conforming lot and, and they were seeking a variance or uh, an extension. And I'm just trying to recall that the, 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 if there's a better um, jurisdictional basis for us to say this is the right way to interpret the, the ordinance. And I'm thinking what we're finding is that there's not. It's just that um, it's, it, the ultimate remedy, remedy is that the house has got destroyed or moved and you can do up to 35 feet. So what's the difference between doing it one particular way versus another? In other words, um, I, I, was, I was suggested number two with a little more detail. Um, why don't we tackle that after we? Um, Fine. I, I, to, no, uh, you know, I mean, I think I think we're headed in the same direction. Okay. I'm not sure I agree that we need different language there, but we can move forward. I, I think if somebody would like to make a motion, that we approve the request of Andrew and Danielle Courier of 17 Ocean View Road, map U3, lot 77, to reconstruct a non-conforming st structure based on section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance. Somebody second that motion? I'll we'll second that. Okay. Um, any further discussion? And I mean, I think now might be an appropriate time to discuss potential findings. So uh, you're, you want more specificity in the additional finding number two because I'm not sure I understand. I'm trying to structure the number two findings of fact within the paragraph reconstruction over replacement. Well, it's. <coughs> um, four, 
the three. Well, I mean, the, 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 the shall not, the will not increase the nonconformity is in two, is in 1943b2. It's the last sentence in the first paragraph, and no case shall a structure be relocated so as to increase its nonconformity. So I mean, I think that's where that language is from. It's not, it's not in 1943b3, except in 1943b3's reference to 1943b2. I would withdraw my objection. Okay. Um, any other discussion on the motion? All in favor? All right, six nothing. I'll read the findings of fact. <clears throat> findings of fact one, this is a request of Andrew and Daniel Courier of 17 Ocean View Road, map U3, lot 77, to reconstruct a non-conforming structure based on section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance. Two, Andrew and Daniel Courier are the owners of record of the subject lot. Three, the subject lot is a non-conforming lot in the RC zone. Four, the non-conforming structure is a single family dwelling connected to public sewer. Additional findings of fact. One, the Zoning Board of Appeals has considered the size of the lot, the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the location of the septic system and other on-site soils suitable for septic systems, the impact on views and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. I don't like that. Um, to accomplish the, it's not a relocation. Reconstruction. Reconstruction. Project. What? Project. Re it's reconstruction. I don't love that either. Project. That, that sounds too vague. <coughs> um, I think reconstruction is the closest. I think so too. Reconstruction? Yes. Okay. I'll, uh, um, and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the reconstruction. Two, the proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. Three, the proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirements to the greatest practical extent. All in favor? Six nothing. So um, it's approved. Thank you. So we done for the night? <laughs> All right, the next order of business. <clears throat> Item number two is to hear the Superior Court remand of the administrative appeal by Maynard and Deborah Murphy of the Code Enforcement Officer's issuance of building permit number 130056 for an additional accessory structure at 27 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 70, as this structure will add over 250 square feet of pervious surface to this lot within the, two, within the 250 feet shoreline zone. Additionally, the Murphys are appealing the Code Enforcement Officer's determination of the location of the shoreland performance overlay district.
Greg Frank. He needs a Greg Good evening. Sorry for the delay. I'm trying to get hooked up here, and we'll see if this technology actually works. Um, my name is Richard Bryant, and I'm the attorney for uh, Mick and Deborah Murphy, who are the appellants in a case involving um, the Goldman property at 27 Pilot Point Road uh, in Cape. <clears throat> and I do have a bunch of materials here. Um, I'm going to take a moment to get organized. Uh, and some of it might be useful to the board if I pass out now so you have it to look to, to reference. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> If we're really fortunate, we won't have to look at these and we can look at the map, but it might be interesting. These are copies of uh, just photographs uh, and JPEGs that the board might want. And these are blow ups of the uh, zoning map um, and the official zoning map itself, at least as a this morning, some what if these are already in the record? Certainly the zoning map is, but what are... The zoning map is, um, I believe that the photographs, uh, for the most part, were not yet in the record. Um, they were going to be presented at the last time we were at the board, but uh, we never really made it to the merits, so they did not get presented at that time. So, so I had a discussion... Put it in the previous pack, like... Are these, are these properly going to be part of the record? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I don't think so if they're getting submitted right now and they if weren't these, in before. I mean, if these were submitted back in September before the September meeting, which was postponed, then they'd be part of the record. If we're just receiving these now, then they're not. I mean, they're not part could, of the record of the prior proceeding, but you're holding a de novo hearing now, so you're allowed to... Right, but there's a petition deadline that every that document needs to be submitted to the board before the hearing. So, I mean, if these are already, I mean, we don't need to make that determination now. If these were already part of the record right. from the previous. Yeah, and map. I'm not certain whether that is the case or not. Again, I, I know the photographs were prepared for the meeting last time. Whether they made it here or not, I don't know. Which actually brings me to another point. Is my understanding was that the. Um, code enforcement officer was going to be presenting the existing record of the various prior proceedings before the board in the board package to you. Um, I had understood that to include the matters that were uh, included in the various Superior Court ADB appeals. Um, and it turned out this morning when I was talking with uh, uh, Mr. McDougall that apparently it's not clear how much, if any, of that material. Um, made it into your packages. I have not seen a clean copy of the package prepared to you. So what I proposed to Ms. McDougall and offered to Ms. Costigan was that since I have copies of the ADB appeal records, which contains not only the transcripts of the previous meetings, the, the minutes, uh, all the exhibits that were presented there, um, I could provide those to the board now so we can make sure that everything that was before you before is presented to you now um, and can be referred to by any party or by the board if they wish. So I have one hard copy and they're very, they're voluminous. I will present it here. I do have a series of PDFs for those as well, which I'm happy to forward to the board uh, if you'd like. So I'm, I'm concerned about the record. What? These are clearly part of the record. They were the record that was presented by the appellants to the Superior Court as the underlying record before the board in the three previous hearings that we've had on this matter, going back to 2012. 
So you're saying that any, any, anything that was submitted to the Superior Court in either of the appeals now is part of this record? Uh, no, I've not included the briefs uh, and those items that, are, that were arguments before the court, but in each ADB appeal we had to present a, a record of the case, which included all the relevant materials that were presented to the code enforcement officer that were part of the appeal, administrative appeal by the Murphys to this board and that were presented to the board. Yeah, I, mean, so, I, I would agree that anything that was previously before the board would be part of this record now. It right. is now. It is now. So, <laughs> so would you like me to physically hand you those large packages so that you have them here before I forget? Uh, I will do that. If you could confirm on the pictures, though, that would be great. You don't have to do it right now, but just down the road, whether those were being or not. Regardless, they will be merely illustrative of points that are raised with when looking at the exhibits that were part of the record. These are the records on appeal for docket number AP 12-60 in the Cumberland County Superior Court and for docket number AP-13-67 in the Cumberland County Superior Court. Not last to the presentation. Um, to just give a procedural background of why we're here today, um, the matters before this board tonight ostensibly were initiated by the August 17, 2012 issuance by the code enforcement officer, previous code enforcement officer, of building permit number 130056 uh, for the Goldman residence at 27 uh, Pilot Point Road, which is map U12, lot 70 allowing the installation of a set of accessory stairs down a steep, steep slope to provide access to the shoreline. The Goldman residence had been built or reconstructed in 2005 with town approval as a lawfully non-conforming structure upon lawfully non-conforming lot uh, in the RA residence zone and in the shoreland performance overlay zone, which is the shoreland zone. Uh, the Goldmans actually hold title through an entity called Pilot Point LLC, but for ease of, ease of use, I'll just refer to it as the Goldman lot. On September 17, 2012, the abutters uh, Maynard and Deb Murphy of 24 Pilot Point Road appealed this uh, building permit on the grounds that the additional structure violated the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance by placing a new structure within 75 feet of the um, normal high water mark, which is the, uh, one of the methods for determining the location of the shoreland zone, and by allowing the impervious surfaces on the Goldman lot above 20 percent, which is a limitation imposed by the shoreland zoning ordinance. Um, additional grounds for the appeal arose subsequently when the following June, the code enforcement officer, the new code enforcement officer, issued a determination of a slightly different new normal high water line setback uh, location, which arguably affected the applicability of the shoreland zone, 75 foot setback, and arguably affected the calculation of the 20 percent impervious surface limitation on the Goldman lot. So tonight's hearing is required um, by the most recent Superior Court order, which remands for a de novo hearing for the merits of the Murphy's challenges to the Goldman permit. To date, just so those of you who have not been on the board for years might know, uh, the Murphy's have been before this board for three separate hearings, one of them a full hearing on the merits, 
and have been up to the Superior Court um, on denials of the Murphy's administrative appeals and have subsequently been successful in those uh, court appeals and have come back down for remand. So the last decision by the Superior Court <clears throat> was last year uh, instructing the board to uh, accept the fact that the Murphys had standing in this case and to hear the merits of their appeal of the Goldman Stair building permit. So the case record is very voluminous, as I said, and I've provided you copies of the record on appeal before the courts here. Um, I do think that there are important aspects of the case which both I and obviously Ms. Costigan on behalf of the Goldmans will want to point to in the, uh, in the record. Um, and I believe that you have materials provided by the code enforcement officer as well, some of which will be uh, helpful to walk through so we can understand exactly what the issues are here. I will also use uh, exhibits tonight just to articulate uh, the rationale for the Murphy's position with respect to the materials already in front of the board. And unless the counsel for the Goldmans have any objection to this or the board has any specific questions, I will pass over the issues of the timeliness of the Murphy's appeal and their standing, since I think those are non-controversial and the court, in the most recent opinion, has specifically uh, found that the Murphy's have, Murphy's have standing to bring these appeals. So, Mary, unless you've got any objection, I'll pass over that part of things. Um, there was a full board hearing in the merits of the Murphy's original appeal uh, back on October 23, 2012. And that board made unanimous findings of fact uh, on the Goldman and Murphy's ownership of their lots, on the issuance of the permit and the timeliness of the Murphy's appeal. And they made unanimous findings of fact on the following really important points. The first was that the Goldman's lot is entirely within the shoreland zone. The second is that more than 20% of the lot was covered with impervious surface. Um, the third finding was that proposed stairs in the permit would increase the impervious surface on the Goldman lot. And finally, they made a finding that the stairs were greater than four feet in width, which relates to another issue in the zoning, uh, in the shoreland zone. These findings were obviously based on the Goldman lot being shown on the zoning map as entirely within the shoreland zone. And if you look at the materials that were handed out to you, you'll see a blow up of uh, the zoning map, the official zoning map at the time. Uh, I'm told that this map here now is the zoning map effective 2012. It was just signed off on the town clerk today. But I'm assured by the town that there are no changes in any aspect of the shoreland zone with respect to the properties at issue here. So effectively, what you're looking at there is the same as the map that's on the wall here, uh, and that is currently the official zoning map. <clears throat> now, the Goldmans had submitted, in connection with their permit, a calculation by John Mitchell of impervious surface that depended upon a shoreward shift of the shoreland zone by approximately 60 feet. And that was based upon a determination by the prior code enforcement officer who issued the permit that the top of the bank, or highest effect of the annual tide of the tides, which was the definition of the normal high water mark for coastal waters, um, was not going to be followed with respect to this property. I would point out that in the 2005 construction of the Goldman residence. There is a survey within your uh, package, and I think I have a copy of which I'll put up, put up on the board here, and if I'm lucky, put up on the PDF on the, on the screen, in which there was a survey by Titcom that showed and, def and accurately defined the top of the bank as the start of the 75-foot setback within the shoreland zone in 2005. So it's clear that back at that point, the town and the owners of the Goldman lot had accepted that that was where the shoreland zone started, that was where the 75-foot setback started, and that was the start of the 250 feet 
of shoreland zone. However, because of the determination, which was not expressed at the time of the uh, issuance of the permit by the then code enforcement officer, he took the position that the normal high water mark was not at the top of the bank as it had been determined by survey before on this property, but instead was at essentially the high annual tide <coughs> uh, mark some 60, some 60 feet down the rocky slope. He also made a determination, again, without a specific statement of the rationale, that indicated the shoreland edge of the, store, of the shoreland zone would be shifted a similar 62 feet towards the ocean and, in effect, caused a change in the zoning map without authority to do so. The Murphys, in their appeal, have argued that only the city council, the town council, has the authority to change the zoning map and that the initial determination by the code enforcement officer was both wrong in interpreting the application of the normal high water mark and wrong in assuming that it had the consequence of moving the inland area of the, shore, of the shoreland zone. Because the previous board in October of 2012 had a unanimous finding on those critical facts regarding the location of the Goldman property in the shoreland zone and the 20% um, lot coverage with, with impervious surface, I think that the mere submission of the same materials that were before the board then really should compel this board to reach the same findings, namely that the Goldman lot is entirely within the shoreland zone, so the application by the Goldmans relying upon the Mitchell calculation of the shoreland zone smaller than the Goldman lot is in violation of the ordinance. Um, that October 3, October 23, 2012 board hearing also found by a less than unanimous vote that the Murphys had standing to appeal and that the issuance of the permit was clearly contrary to the ordinance. Then quite amazingly, the board went on to vote by the same four to three margin to deny the Murphys the appeal anyway. At that point, um, there was a discussion with the town attorney in attendance who uh, pointed out to the board the inconsistency of the findings they had made and the denial of the Murphy's permit. So there was a vote to reconsider the findings and the conclusion that the permit was issued clearly contrary to the ordinance was voted on again and failed by a three to four vote. Um, which provided at least some surface consistency to the findings of the board. Uh, of course, the Superior Court overturned that decision when the Murphys appealed uh, to, the, to the court, saying it was just illogical for the board to have made the findings of fact they did and then turn around and deny the permit. The, board actually, the court actually determined that there was a, <clears throat> that there was a failure to use the proper standard of review and which is why we have the de novo determination uh, before the board tonight. However, when the Murphys came back to appeal that, uh, to hear that administrative appeal on remand, they also had to file a separate administrative appeal of a determination by the new code enforcement officer that set a different standard for the location of the normal high water line with respect to this property. <clears throat> although it, he apparently interpreted it as having the same effect of not simply moving the 75-foot setback from the normal high water line towards the ocean, this time something like 67 feet, but also, like the previous code enforcement officer, determined that despite the shoreland zone being shown on the map as entirely encompassing the Goldman lot, that it shifted the shoreland zone some uh, considerable distance towards the ocean and meant only a portion of the Goldman lot was then subject to the shoreland zone 20% cap on impervious service. So at that hearing on both of those uh, administrative appeals, the old one on remand from the court and the new one on the new determination by the code enforcement officer, um, 
the board never made it to the merits because they revisited the notion of standing that had been raised and decided in favor of the Murphys in the first case, and that was mentioned in passing by the Superior Court, and decided that on both of the appeals, the Murphys had no standing despite their being determined to be an abutter uh, of the lot. Abutter in both the sense of having um, their residence directly across the street and overlapping with the Goldman property, as well as having specific deeded rights in the Surfside Avenue, which is on the downslope side, uh, shore side of the Goldman ordinance, uh, the Goldman lot. So once again, that decision on standing was appealed to the Superior Court. The Superior Court found in the Murphy's favor. We're now back at the beginning of trying to hear the merits of this appeal, which have always been, have already been presented what? So what's the gravamen of the Murphy's appeal? The Murphys say that if you look at the ordinance, the, they can demonstrate that the building permit was issued by the code enforcement officer in violation of his duties under ordinance section 931, which says the code enforcement officer shall interpret and enforce the provisions of this ordinance and shall require compliance with its requirements and restrictions. It's also in violation of ordinance section 933B, which says that no building permit shall be issued until the proposed construction or alteration complies with the provision of the ordinance or decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals or approval of the Planning Board. So we believe the Murphys can demonstrate that just like the original code enforcement officer's determination that the normal high water line reflected on the original Mitchell surface, uh, impervious surface plan was improperly decided based upon the language of the normal high water line under the ordinance at the time. A similar determination can be made with respect to the uh, impropriety of the current code enforcement officer's subsequent determination finding the normal high water line again somewhere at the base of a cliff rather than at the top of the bank as originally uh, provided in the 2005 uh, permits for the, re for the residents on the Golden Lot. Most importantly, the Goldmans want the normal high water line determination to be read to effectively remove the stairs at issue here from the 75-foot shoreland zone setback and to effectively shift the shoreland zone so that only a portion of the Goldman Lot is subject to the 20 percent impervious surface requirement. The Murphys contend that the code enforcement officer misread the ordinance and has a fundamental misconception as to how the shoreland zone boundary is determined, which is by the zoning map, and that moreover the code enforcement officer has no power to usurp the exclusive authority of the town council to alter the boundaries of the shoreland zone as shown on the shoreland zoning map. So we should talk a little bit about the nonconformities that exist on the Goldman lot, just so you understand how that works. Um, as I said, they're located in a, in a uh, residence A district and uh, in the shoreland zone as shown on the map. Um, the Goldman lot is a nonconforming lot under section 9.13 definition, which talks about a single lot which, as of the effective date of the ordinance, does not meet the minimum lot area, net lot area per dwelling unit, minimum street frontage, or other similar lot requirements of the district in which it is located. Now, it's a little unclear to me whether the 20% impervious surface standard should fall under that category of the definition as a similar uh, lot requirement but I believe it does. Regardless of whether it does or not, it's clear that the structures upon the Goldman lot are non-conforming structures, again under the definition in 913. And a non-conforming building or structure is one that does not meet the space and bulk standards of the district in which it is located. There was considerable confusion at the previous hearing on the merits by the board. Uh, as to whether the existence of the 20% impervious surface 
within the shoreland zone creates a non-conforming lot or a non-conforming structure. Um, I would point to a couple sections of the ordinance that, that I think help clarify that. Again, in my view, it is both, but the ordinance at section 1944 regarding non-conformance within the shoreland zone deals only with non-conforming vacant lots and non-conforming contiguous built lots. It doesn't deal with non-contiguous built lots like the Golden Lot. That section 1944 does address the enlargement or relocation or reconstruction of non-conforming structures. And we also have a provision in section 1913 that defines an increase in non-conformity of a structure, which is changes in a structure or property which cause further deviation from the dimensional standards creating the non-conformity such as, but not limited to, uh, reduction in water body, tributary stream, or wet, wetland setback district, increase in lot coverage, which I would tell you is, I think, similar to increase in impervious surface coverage, or increase in height of a structure. So the most harmonious reading of the ordinance, I believe, uh, is to treat impervious surface violations as a non-conforming structure issue, um, at least when enlargement of a non-conforming uh, structure is proposed. And by this reading, I would say that every structure on the golden lot which contributes to the total area of impervious surface being more than 20% of that lot is itself a non-conforming structure. If the square footage of all of the impervious surfaces on that lot ever trips below the 20%, then all the remaining structures would be conforming structures. So looking at the residential ACE nonconformities, um, the lot area of this, of the Goldman lot, is 73,534 feet, which is below the 80,000 square foot standard. Uh, there's an identical dwelling unit uh, density. Uh, again, lot coverage of one unit per 80,000 square foot, and their lot is smaller than that. The street frontage of the Goldman lot is 80 feet, and the RA district requires 125 feet. The front yard setback is 26 feet 10 inches and 30 inches, 30, sorry, 26 feet 10 inches, 30 feet is required by the RA uh, space and bulk standards, although the planning board in approving the Goldman lot did allow the reduction to, to the current 2610. Similarly, side yard setbacks are supposed to be 30 feet. The current side yard setback is 18 feet and 3 inches although the planning board had allowed 25 feet um, for the new portion of the residence constructed in 2005. There is a rear yard setback as well, um, which is also 30 feet. And from the location of the stairs on this property, I would say that the stairs are in violation of that because the Proposed stairs are approximately 22 to 23 feet from the rear property line of the Goldman's lot. With respect to the shoreland nonconformities, um, we have the impervious surface of the lot has been calculated in a number of different ways. According to Mr. Mitchell, who did not use the entire lot within the shoreland zone, the number is below 20%. But if you look at the original uh, survey done in 2005, which is shown on this site plan, and I'll put it up here, and if I'm lucky, I can put it up on the board. Um, you can see that there's a calculation here of allowable lot coverage, which proposes the proposed coverage of 3,540.26 square feet, or 3,504 square feet of improvements to create the Golden Residence in 2005. Their allowable lot coverage of 20% of the lot was 3,506.28 square feet. So they were two feet under the maximum amount, 
of impervious surface they were allowed to put on this lot in 2005. The problem with this calculation is that when the Goldmans added more impervious surfaces, including stairs in this section of the property and the stairs that issue in this building permit down here, this section of the property, they clearly increased the square footage of impervious surfaces on this lot by at least 292 feet, which is what Mr. Mitchell testified to the board was the square footage of the stair structure at the base of the, of the property. So these issues then turn on whether the entire lot falls within the shoreland zone, and therefore they're over the maximum almost by definition, or not. However, I also would point out that when you examine Mr. Mitchell's calculation, of which there have been several, both with the original application for the new stairs, and subsequently following a determination by the code enforcement officer of a different uh, setback, normal high watermark, which I hope you have in your materials. It is a colored plan. This is Mr. Missile's final uh, calculations. What, you will, do, what you, you will notice by comparing this material with this material is that the foundation plans for the 2005 Goldman residence are the, are the calculations that we used to determine what the lot coverage was. In fact, this building has, and it can be shown by photographic evidence, um, and by just looking at the plans and doing basic middle school math, these structures here were already in excess of the 20% that was in theory calculated at the time. So I think what actually happened is the zoning, as a code enforcement officer at that time, never bothered to check what the building plan said was the uh, actual square footage of these structures and just accepted this calculation put on the, uh, on the uh, 2005 plan. Similarly, when Mr. Mitchell made his determination, it's clear he used exactly the same outlines of the foundations of the buildings. It is also true that there are photographs, including photographs presented by, um, by Ms. Costigan, that show that there are substantial eaves that surround virtually all of the perimeter of this property. There are also substantial structures outside of the structures that are shown here, including two sets of existing stairways that already exist, pre-existed the new stairway that provided access to the shore. One of them is a series of granite steps that proceed up here, and six or eight of them. And another is a series of stone steps that come down this slope here. And again, I have some photographs that illustrate that, that, that might be useful for the board to see. Um, and in fact, if you'll look at that package of photographs I passed out, you will see the very first item is just a Google satellite view, which I'm sure was in one form or another before the board before. It's been looked at several times. Um, and this is a picture of the Goldman lot prior to the installation of the new set of stairs, which are, would be sort of towards the bottom of the, of the lot. To the right, as you're looking at this, uh, at the shore at the base of the, of the picture, you will see a series of, I think, six or eight white strips, and those are existing granite stone stairs that provide access from the upper level of the lot down to the shore. To the left, somewhat obscured by the trees, there are also stones that have been placed to provide a similar stairway of considerable portion around the west side of the house. The second photograph here also reflects um, pre-construction, or actually during the start of construction. You can see the existing stone stairways to the right of the, of the, of the photo. The third photograph, again, you see the stone stairs to the right of the photo. 
but you can look at the map of the, <clears throat> or the picture of the structure and see that the gables to the right-hand side, the upper stories of, that, of this structure, are on the order of two to three feet beyond the outside sheathing of the walls, which by itself is approximately five or six inches beyond where the outline of the foundation is. So just the eaves of this structure alone are on the order of at least 250 feet in additional structure that's not shown in any calculations either back in 2005 or in any of the Mitchell um, calculations. The next several photos really just show more of the construction are not particularly relevant, but if you get to the sixth photo, you will see that, which is taken towards the left of the house, you will see that there are similar gables on the left side of the house, west side of the house, and you will see in the woods um, a series of stone steps that provide access, impervious surface, down from the upper part of the lot to the shore. The next two pictures, a little fuzzy, uh, simply shows that the sheathing of the, of, the outside, of the outside of the structure is, extends outward from the foundation of the, of the buildings. This, the first one's of the garage. The next one is a picture between the garage and the back of the main house. And you can see that there is a foundation, there's a significant step out to where the shingles are on the right-hand structure. On the left-hand structure, there is also a, um, an eave that, that traverses the entire width of the, of the garage. So the point of all of that is that however you calculate the amount of impervious structure of this property, it's obvious that the structure there exceeded the 20% limit at the time of the issuance of this permit, as it did in 2005 when the structure, when the uh, residence was built, and that no change in the shifting of the zone is going to modify the fact that you have 250 extra feet, at least, of impervious surface on the shore, shoreward side of the line where Mr. Mitchell, or the code infrastructure, enforcement officer would have you say that the landward boundary of the shoreland zone uh, has been shifted to. I did a little, like I say, middle school math and based upon the plans that are in the code enforcement officer's file for the building of the structure of the Re Goldman residence, and my calculations, simple math, show that even if you shifted the zone, there is at least 286 square feet of impervious surface beyond what Mr. Mitchell calculated as meeting the 20% requirement with the shifting of the zone. So I'll include a copy of, of that calculation for you. It should be reviewed in conjunction with looking at the plans here, as well as in conjunction with the building plant itself. Which is in the record, but uh, if I can find it shortly, I'll provide that as well. Um, there is another matter which was, again, in the record. This is the same exhibit as uh, before, uh, the site plan of A100, but this is with the annotations that were made by Andrew Murphy in the original hearing. In this day, this was the board as well. Again, it shows that um, there is a determination of the top of the bank by the surveyor. 
right here. And this was the original seven five foot setback. It shows that um, there were there was a uh, stairway here on the original uh, plan that is not shown on this calculation. Um, obviously, no beams shown on any of these structures. No stairs in here. No stairway down here. And the allowable lot coverage must have been exceeded. This said there was 2. Point, essentially two feet left. And we know that there was at least several hundred feet left. So this leads us back to the question of whether uh, the golden lot is entirely in the shoreland district. And I think that's probably the key questions for, uh, to, be, to be answered here. The board previously determined that the lot was in the shoreland zone because it's shown so on the zoning map. If you look at the ordinance section 1922, it specifically says zoning districts are defined as shown on the official copy of the zoning map of Cape Elizabeth, Maine. It goes on to say that the zoning map is hereby made a part of the ordinance. And the zoning map is entirely consistent with the ordinance language in effect at the time with respect to the textual description of the shoreland zoning ordinance. That is, all land within 250 feet of the horizontal distance of the upland edge of a coastal wetland, including all areas affected by tidal actions such as rocky ledges. Again, I've omitted a few words in the middle there. The zoning map is also clearly consistent with the then applicable, ap application, excuse me, then applicable definition of the normal high water line for coastal wetlands which is in Ordinance 1913, the apparent extreme effect of the effect of the tide, excuse me, the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tide, i.e., the top of the bank, cliff, or beach above high tide. In short, the zoning map shows that the entire Goldman lot is entirely within the shoreland zone because the town council adopted the zoning map upon the understanding that the Goldman lot is within 250 feet of the top of a rocky cliff which is the extreme limit of the apparent effect of the tides. And we know that that's the case because in 2005, the Goldmans or their predecessors mapped with a survey here where the top of the bank is relative to the structures on the property. So the Goldman's stair permit application contends that the shoreland zone began not at the previously mapped top of the bank on the Tickham survey, but rather 60 feet seaward where the still water highest annual tide might lie. Um, and again, subsequent to that, the replacement code enforcement officer determined that in fact, he thought it should be out of stain on the rocks, which was some 67 feet. Um, seaward of the top of the bank. The normal high water line of the coastal waters in effect at that time is defined as that line on the shore of tidal waters, which is the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tides. And the stain line that is the most recent determination by the code enforcement officer of where that line should be is not consistent with the language of the ordinance. It certainly is the truth that the stain line is an effect of the tide because it is caused by algal organisms that require periodic inundation to live on the rocks there. But it is also clear that it is obviously not the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tide when beyond that stain line you have a rocky cliff that is entirely devoid of organic soils capable of supporting non-salt um, tolerant life. It's the mechanical scouring action of the waves and it's the effect of salt spray and the occasional inundation in storms and other high tides that prevents organic soils from forming 
and is inhospitable to plants that aren't salt tolerant. That is obviously a more extreme limit of the effect of the tide. If it weren't for the ocean there, that and the, and the effect of the tide, that bank would not be exposed bare rock. It's as simple as that. That definition and interpretation was adopted and, by the town and used by the town and approved by the law court in the Mack case back in 1983, which noted that the ordinance in Cape Elizabeth presumes that the normal high water line is located well above the tide line. That is the still water bathtub line that, that the code enforcement officer in this case uh, attempted, attempted to use. Um, we do have a provision in the ordinance about conflicts or inconsistencies in the ordinance. And the rule of construction in section 1910.1 is that those conflicts or inconsistencies within the ordinance or with other applicable laws um, should be read in favor of the most restrictive ruling. That provision, to the extent that you want to say there is any inconsistency between <clears throat> the definition of normal high water line um, and the top of the bank, tells you that the code enforcement officer should be compelled to use the top of the bank, especially in an instance in which it had been surveyed and accurately defined prior to his determination. And that rule of construction is also entirely uh, in accordance with the guidance given to code enforcement officers by the Department of Environmental Protection in carrying out the shoreland zoning laws, which says that where you have a choice between a less restrictive interpretation and a more restrictive interpretation, the more restrictive interpretation should prevail. There is a reference to that specific direction in the materials before the board already in the, in the record. The problem with this court, or with this board determining that it's appropriate for the code enforcement officer to, to shift the landward side <clears throat> of the shoreland zone by moving the normal high water mark or having a different interpretation of where that starts, is that it effectively results in a wholesale amendment of the zoning map by administrative fiat. It violates ordinance section 9103, which requires that any changes to the zoning map be passed by the town council after going through a specific process and be reviewed by the DEP when that change in any way affects the shoreland zone. There's considerable case law on how the zoning map controls over the zoning ordinance language and that case law is very clear. clear. It contradicts the Goldman's assertion or the council's assertion that the text controls over the map. That's simply not true. As recently as 2013, less than two years ago, the law court in a case called Summer Winds Cottage versus Town of Scarborough reaffirmed earlier decisions that the adoption of zoning map is a legislative act that cannot be overturned by an administrator's ruling even if the zoning map is subsequently determined to be wrong. Now the ordinance in Summerwind down in Scarborough had several definitions, but, but one of them was a resource protection district. <clears throat> and it said anything within 250 feet of certain waters was in resource protection and could not be built upon and could not be occupied for residential use. But there was a, another portion of the section that said we're going to call a separate district called the Shoreland Overlay District that's also within 250 feet of those same protected waters, but it includes already developed properties. So for those properties that were already developed, essentially grandfathered properties, they were in the Shoreland Overlay Zone rather than the Resource Protection District, and the Shoreland, Over Shoreland Overlay Zone allowed for construction and it allowed for residential occupation. The abutters lot in Summerwind was clearly shown by the zoning map to be in the shoreland overlay zone. That is, it was developable, it could be occupied for residential use. But it was also 
a completely undeveloped lot. And even though the zoning map was in error when one looked at the text of the ordinance and then went out and determined in the field whether the property had been developed or not, the law court made clear that the Board of Appeals was appropriately acting in granting a variance to the owner of that lot to build on that lot because it was in the shoreland zone, regardless of the text describing the shoreland zone as, as, as involving only developed lots. In that decision, the law court made clear that the decision to include the lot in the shoreland zone was a legislative act by the town council, could not be overturned other than by another legislative act by the town council. And I want to point out that that conclusion was true despite the Scarborough Ordinance having language in it that the shoreland zoning map was, quote, merely illustrative of boundary locations. So the map act, the, the ordinance actually had some language that tried to say, oh, don't really worry about the map. And the law court held, no. Once the map is drawn, that map is the zoning map and defines the boundaries of the zoning districts until the town council says otherwise. I'll provide you all with a copy of the summer wind case. Um, there's another case that I'll provide you a copy with, which is Nardi versus the town of Kennebunk, which was a superior court case <clears throat> uh, in which there was a municipal ordinance that said, if there's a conflict between the text and the map, the text controls. Again, a similar situation to what was attempted up in Summerwinds. Um, and in that case, in Nardi, the abutters lot was shown within the resource prote protection zone, which prohibited development. But in fact, the lot didn't meet the specific requirements of the text to be involved in the, to be included in the, in the resource protection zone. <clears throat> and the abutter went out and got evidence that showed, look, my lot doesn't contain any of these protected resources, so shouldn't have been in this zone in the first place. And once again, the Superior Court overturned the board decision and voided building permits that were issued, holding that the for the text to override the zoning ordinance, there had to be a conflict on the face of the ordinance and the face of the map. So you had to have a map that had some dimension or some uh, specific reference that was directly contradicted by the language of the text in order for the text to control over the map. Nardi cited with approval a case called Veerman, the town of China, which is again a Superior Court case by Justice Alexander, that summer winds, the law court also uh, uh, quoted from. And in that case, the Veerman court, court stated that allowing zoning administrators to amend boundary lines would open the door to considerable mischief in an area already affected by considerable fact-finding, discretion, and unpredictability. And quoting from Veerman, in effect, the lines on zoning maps could be rendered worthless and the integrity of zoning plans undermined if administrators could determine on a case-by-case -case basis that individual lots really did not belong in their designated zones. The administrator who readily places lots within a resource protection district today may be replaced by a, tomorrow by one who readily takes them out. It is precisely to avoid these concerns that zoning map drawing is committed to the legislative function and administrative moving of map boundaries is barred, subject only to closely prescribed variance criteria. So looking back at that series of cases, including the very recent one by the law court, we do see that what the code enforcement officer has attempted to do here, and the Goldmans are urging the board to approve, is to move the location of the normal high water line seaward, and in their doing, shift the landward location, the landward boundary of the shoreland zoning away from where it's shown on the map so that it only covers a portion of the Goldman lot. And it's just not allowed under the law. So another way to articulate that is with respect to whether the lot is entirely within the shoreland zone, 
the code enforcement officer's determination of where to start measuring the shoreland zone or the normal high water line uh, on the seaward side really has no effect on where the map shows the landward side of the shoreland zone is. Because the zoning map shows the Goldman lot is entirely within the shoreland zone, it must remain there until the town council amends that, that map. Um, I anticipate Ms. Costigan might say, but golly gee, the text says the shoreland zone is only supposed to be 250 feet. And I would point out to you that the ordinance already contemplates that the specific measurements of the text may not be entirely accurate, that there is some variation. Um, if you look at Ordinance 196.11a, uh, sorry, 1924, it provides that where district boundary lines are shown approximately on the location of existing property lines or lot lines, and the exact location of the boundaries is not indicated by means of figures, distances, or otherwise described, that means on the map itself. The property or lot line shall be the district boundary lines. Can you read the rest of that section sure. too? Yeah. In the cases in which the location of boundaries is not defined by detailed description at the time of enactment, such locations are determined by the distance in feet when given upon the map or when distances are not given by the scale of the map. And Cape Elizabeth's map is a scalable map. So if you zoom in as we did on the materials they provided or you zoom out, the shoreland zone is going to stay in the same place relative to the property lines. Can you talk about the uncertainty piece given the definition of normal high tide line? Is um, that the uncertainty clause of that, of 19.24, where uncertainty exists as to the location of any zoning district boundary, the property owner so effective may request in writing that the code enforcement officer make a formal written determination? I agree that the code enforcement officer, I think, probably has the authority to say normal high water line is top of the bank, if that's the most obvious thing. In some cases, that won't be. And he may make a determination that it is elsewhere. Mm -hmm. To that extent, I think that the uncertainty can be resolved by the code enforcement officer by saying, here's where we start that 75-foot setback. Because under the ordinance, setbacks are determined by that normal high water line or other item found on the face of the earth. Zoning districts are not determined that way. Zoning, determines are, zoning districts are determined by the definition of the, of the ordinance by where they are on the map. So if the code enforcement officer decides that the normal high water line is a thousand feet out to sea, more power to him. It's underwater, but if, if the board upholds that kind of discretion, uh, you know, more power to them. It doesn't shift the shoreland zone a thousand feet off the shore. The shoreland zone is where it appears on the map, at least on the landward edge, until the town council decides, oh, we made a mistake, we really want it to be halfway there. I will note that, and this is important, the town council recently amended the definition of normal high water line. And they amended in a certain respect, how the starting place of that 75-foot setback is determined in the shoreland zone by, by modifying the definition of normal high water line of coastal waters to be past the highest astronomical tide plus three feet. That's entirely within their purview to do. What they did not do, and they specifically told the public they weren't doing, was changing the zoning map. So while that change may affect the 75-foot setback within the shoreland zone, it does not shift the shoreland zone, and it can't shift the shoreland zone until the town council says, gee, looking at this, we ought to redraw that map so that this property is excluded or this property is included. Whatever is drawn on the map is the official zoning map, and it remains that way. Can I ask you another question? Sure. No, you're not done. No, no. But I'm, I'm trying to track you, and I'm just trying to figure out, to be perfectly blunt, what difference does it make? If Can you just synopsize for me? If they're set back 75 feet, or if they're totally in the Shoreland Protection District? It only makes a difference in this case. Yep. Because 
if the shoreland, if the normal high water mark is the top of the bank, which it was at the time of the creation of the, of the residence, and we contend remained so at the time of the issuance of this building permit for the stairs, then we believe the stairs would have been within that 75 foot setback and would not have been permitted. So do Again, you it's a separate independent issue from the 20% impervious service. It's you can't build stuff in the 75 foot setback with very limited exceptions that do not apply here. Okay. So with regard to the zone, the code enforcement officer not being able to make an interpretation that impacts the zoning, right. that would only impact the 20% impervious service and yes. not impact the setback issue, which you concede he has the ability under the ordinance to interpret. I think he does. Okay. I think I disagree that he should have placed it where he did, but I think he has the authority to do so. Okay. Um, I'm following you now. Thank okay. you. Sure. Um, okay. So we talked about how the... <clears throat> how the ordinance contemplates the what the text describes as a 250 foot zone actually being larger be, because it says if the line is near a property line we're going to go to the property line if the zone line is in a street we're going to go to the middle of the street even if 250 feet would be to the edge of the street we're going to the middle of the street um, and I've already talked talked some about the how you how you calculate the 20% impervious area uh, based upon not the foundation but actually what is uh, covered under the definition of impervious surface. Um, and I just would point that out to you again is in, that's also in 1913. And that's the total area of a parcel, oh, excuse me, I take that back. Um, there is a provision in the ordinance definitions which talks about an increase um, in impervious surfaces. And that's separately defined as well. So impervious surfaces are the total area of a parcel consists of building and associated constructed facilities, areas which have been or will be covered with low permeability material, such as asphalt or concrete, areas such as gravel roads and unpaved parking areas, which have been or will be compacted through design or use to reduce their permeability. Common impervious surfaces include, not limited to, rooftops, again, the eaves of the house, walkways, patios, driveways, parking and storage areas, concrete and asphalt paving, gravel roads, packed earthen materials, oiled macadam, other surfaces which similarly impede the natural, infil natural infiltration of stormwater. So under those definitions, I think those extra structures I showed you on the lot that are there on the lot today, the stairways going up either side, uh, the arranged stones which act as a stairway, are impervious surfaces which need to be counted. When you're talking about the eaves of the house, yep. and I'm looking at these pictures, I'm looking at picture number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I guess it's picture eight. Oh, and look, you numbered them. Sorry, I didn't count. <laughs> um, are you talking about the overhang of the roof that yes. has under it crushed stone? Yes. Okay, so it is you're clear not that the crushed, crushed stone, stone as Pervious. The crust stone underneath is not an impervious surface. I agree I with agree. that. <laughs> oh, good. We're on the same page there. However, the overhang of the eave over that area is a roof, which is an impervious surface under the definition of the ordinance. And that's why you have to go out at least a couple feet from the foundations of those buildings to get an accurate calculation of what the impervious surfaces are. But are you also counting the stairs that were on the view looking toward at the back of the house, the stairs on the right, you said there were six or seven granite strips there? Yes. Um, it looks like the landings between them are grass. Yes, but just the, my calculation was simply, I think a one and a half foot by six foot or eight foot, just the stone themselves. Okay. Similarly on Mr. Mitchell's calculation of the upper patios as well as the stairways at question here, you will see there were some blank spaces in the middle, and that's because there are grass spaces. I agree that you don't count that pervious surface in the middle of those structures. Can I ask another question on Please. this point? Um, the eaves, I did some rough math, and it looks like that would add up to roughly 300 square feet. Does that leave them over or under the 20%? Over. Even if you take out the eaves, they're still over. Uh, yes, they had, they suggested that their lot coverage balance on Mr. Mitchell's latest interpretation, which again suggests that you've eliminated 
you know, 20 percent or I don't know, 10 percent of the of the lot from lot service uh, from shoreline coverage, his lot coverage balance is 58.2 square feet, and there's certainly more than 58.2 square feet um, in those additional structures. And again, I think his calculation is wrong because he's got to include the whole lot, in which case he's well, well, well over by many, many hundreds of feet the impervious surface standard. Um, I did mention that, that there's one sort of separate uh, provision in which someone might be able to say, I can put a, a stairway um, under the shoreland zoning ordinance. Um, and that is if you look at um, ordinance section 19611E2F, which is a space and bulk standards for the shoreland zone. Um, there's a, the very last sort of note after the chart saying these are all the things you can do. This is the minimum lot coverage. This is the minimum setback. Um, this is the maximum impervious surface area. There are a series of notes, and, and note F there suggests that it is possible that notwithstanding the requirements above, that is all the rest of the space and bulk uh, provisions in the chart above, stairways or similar structures may be allowed to provide shoreland access in areas of steep slopes or unstable soils with a permit for the code enforcement officer, provided the structure is limited to a maximum of four feet in width, that the structure doesn't extend below or over the normal high water line of the water body or wetland, um, unless permitted by DEP, and those are issues where you have, you're running a pier or a dock out to a, a, a water functional use. Uh, and the third requirement is that the applicant demonstrate that no reasonable alternative exists on the property. And in this case, we know there are at least two alternatives that exist. The stone granite st strips on the right-hand side of the house and the placed stones on the left-hand side, which get you from the upper residence down to the shoreland. Um, as to whether the intent of putting these stairs was to try to fall into that category, I would point you to Mr. Goldman's testimony before the board last time, which is again in the transcript and in, uh, in your materials, um, at the October 23, 2012 board hearing, where he said, and all we wanted to do was to put some steps on our property, not in the easement, on our property, so we could get down to the ocean easily. So he has specifically said that the intent of putting these steps was to provide shore access. However, the plans themselves do not comply with the requirements of the 19611E2F because it's clear that the stairs that he installed were not four foot wide stairs. They range from eight to 15 or 18 feet, um, depending upon whether you include the balustrades on them. Um, and again, there are, there are all alternatives to allow access to the shore on the property, at least two that we know of. So, I'm happy to answer any other questions that the board has. I know there's other people want to talk, and I've been talking far too long, um, but I've been waiting years to do this. Uh, the Murphys have demonstrated that the Goldman Stair permit was improperly issued and in violation of the ordinance, and that the code enforcement officer's determination of the normal high water mark is inconsistent with the shoreland zoning ordinance in effect at the time. Um, and I think we've conclusively demonstrated that the seaward reduction or relocation of the normal high water mark um, can be construed consistent with the ordinance, but it cannot alter the landward side of the shoreland zone, um, which incorporates the entire Goldman lot within the shoreland zone as shown on the zoning, zoning map. I would note to the board that the Goldmans went ahead and constructed these stairs despite their knowledge that the approvals were in litigation and were subject to being voided. Um, they did so at their own risk. The board should void that building permit as improperly granted by the code enforcement officer, and they should order the removal of those steps. I think they should void the code enforcement officer's determination of the relocation of the normal high water line as something other than the top of the bank that was in effect at the time. That may be a moot point, um, but given the new definition uh, that the town council has adopted, perhaps it is or perhaps it isn't. 
Um, but regardless of that determination, the board should confirm that the proper interpretation and application of the ordinance dictates that the Goldman lot remains entirely within the shoreland zone as reflected on the shoreland map until such time as the zoning map is amended by the town council and is therefore subject to the 20% impervious surface standard. I have that, a question, Mr. Brown. Yes, please. Um, uh, I don't think I have a copy of the Titcom survey from 2005 but in, in my packet, but um, can you tell me where the 250-foot shoreland zone boundary is depicted on that plan? It, does it encompass the entire lot? It encompasses the entire lot because the calculation here of allowable lot coverage is the entire square footage of the lot of 17,500 square feet times 0.20, which is the 20% limitation, which is only found in the uh, shoreland zone. And that gives you the 3,506 and change. Thanks. Uh, square foot limit. So is there a boundary shown on that plan? Um, I don't know if the inland edge is shown because yeah. um, um, it's, it's shown. I, know, I do know that the top of the is shown here and the 75 foot setback on the top of the bank is shown sure. on, the, on the survey itself. I'm not sure where the zoning line runs the pilot point or whether it's the property line there. But again, I would refer to the map, which makes very clear. Yeah, I guess that that's what I'm getting at. And the, we also have a survey uh, from Northeast Civil Solutions in our packet that shows a stamped survey that shows the 250-foot shoreland zone boundary clearly measured from uh, the normal high water line determined presumably um, from that from the water staining on the on the cliffs. Right. So, so the problem with that is <coughs> that that effectively changes the zoning map. Yeah. And you can't do that. That's what all those summer wind and all those other cases are about, is that the town council wants to change the map they can, but until they do, that defines under the language of your ordinance, that defines where the zoning district boundary is. So, so the survey, so the line shown on the survey is, 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 is not it correct. is not in slides with the ordinance, which is why the building permit should never have been permitted in the first place. No matter where you move that boundary of the normal high water line, it doesn't change the fact that the zoning map has the entire lot within the shoreland zone. And that's the official zoning map of the town of Cape Elizabeth. And that imposes the 20% impervious surface requirement on the entire lot. Sure. So back to section 19.2.4, location of district boundaries that Joanna talked about a little. And it, and it talks about this uncertainty, where uncertainty exists as to the location of any zoning district boundary. And it talks about a, a, a finding by the code enforcement officer. You, you're saying that would not apply to I'm saying you this situation because the shoreland zone boundary is, uh, is certain based on the map? With respect to the landward side, yes, it is. With respect to where the normal high water line is, which one could say defines the seaward side of the shoreland zone, there can be uncertainty. Sure. Okay. And again, I think the code enforcement officer made the wrong decision, but it's certainly within his purview to try to determine that in accordance with the language of the, of the ordinance. So it, let me let me ask a hypothetical <clears throat> question. If if we, it, it, I, I understand your um, your position that the whole lot is in the the shoreland zone and and thus it's the, the impervious area coverage is greater than twenty percent. Right. If there was a situation where it, it was close and so and we were to use the zoning map to determine an exact location of the shoreland zone boundary, how could that be done from a, a map that is that's at a one inch to twenty five hundred? Because scale? you go up to the previous paragraph of nineteen two four that says where district boundary lines are shown approximately 
on the location of existing property lot lines. Um, the property lot line shall be the district boundary line. So it already contemplates the circumstance in which you have a zoning boundary line running roughly along a street or along a property line. And in this case, we can see that the golden lot here, mm -hmm. the blue line is the district boundary. It runs approximately along the property line. So I think that's, you're compelled by section 924 to say that's where the landward boundary is. So you're, you're saying that the shoreland zone district boundary is approximate on the map, but not uncertain. So therefore, we should, it should fall to the, the lot line yeah. or the center. It's of the a little different from, uh, and there should be a distinction made between the shoreland zone and the resource protection districts. Because those resource protection districts are effectively setback numbers. Mm -hmm. And you do have to go out and decide, gee, what are the hydric soils like? And what's the vegetation here? And where do I draw this line? You don't have to do that with respect to the shoreland zone because the town council has already drawn it. And they said, it is right here. Um, and if it's close to the boundary line, we mean the boundary line, the, the property line. So if clearly, the surveyor from Northeast Civil Solutions didn't understand that. I, yeah, I think there's a fundamental misconception about how you define or construe the shoreland zone. And I think it's because they're focused on the text part. Yeah. And they say, gee, I find this, the text says go 250 feet, I can draw that down to a millimeter. Sure. If I'm working from a still water line like Hat or Hast. Um, but that's not what the ordinance says, and that's not how the law works with respect to shoreland zones. Thank you. Okay. So am I understanding you right that there are essentially two issues? Number one, the 75-foot setback. And there is some uncertainty, we would all agree, given the kind of vague definition of high water mark with using the IE and all of that, that certainly it's reasonable for there to be uncertainty that the code enforcement officer would then make a determination under 1924 about the location of that line. And then if that determination was made appropriately, then the 75 foot setback is not an issue on the steps. But that the overall zone, which is shown on the zoning map as in the Shoreland Overlay District, which is shown as encompassing the whole Goldman lot, cannot be changed on the upland edge or the lowland edge or the water edge. Well, I guess it could on I the think water, the water, li water edge. Not is on relevant. the high water, not on the land side yeah. by the code enforcement officer then the 20% impervious surface requirement applies or limitation applies. And so then help me understand where, what the evidence is in the record on that impervious surface, that be, it, the property being over that 20% status kind of with the definition right. of impervious surface that's in the ordinance. And I know you're pointing to the Mitchell map, but, but walk me through it, because I've also you know, got your kind of back of the envelope calculation, which I'm not, can you just walk me through those sure. calculations? Sure, I, I, I think it all goes back to this, to what happened in 2005 when you had a surveyor. Before you go there, sure. are, am I correctly understanding that those are the two issues? Um, ish. <laughs> ish. Ish. I, I would say that I, I am more um, pessimistic about the ability of the code enforcement officer to deviate from the top of the bank in this specific instance because it was used before on this property um, on a, by a survey, not by a landscape architect or sketch plan or whatever. So it was clearly part of the record of this case. Um, and it's been, that definition has been upheld by the law court. So. I think deviating from that, the there's a burden of proof. But the ordinance grants the code enforcement officer under 1924 the authority to make that decision, not a surveyor, not a landscape yep. architect. It's the, the CEO's jurisdiction under 1924. Yes. 
Okay. Yes, subject, obviously. I, I will point out that in the case laws like Nardi, um, uh, there was an argument that the ordinance authorized an administrator to make a determination in, in the areas of uncertainty like this. And in that case, the court said, it's not enough to say, oh, we'll let the administrator handle this. If you don't give that administrator very clear guidelines on how they're supposed to make that decision, including what's the burden of proof, what specific items do you look at, how, you know, which priority do you have to give things, um, then that would be an impermissible delegation of legislative authority because it was too vague. It was essentially unconstitutional. So, Although I agree the ordinance here says that the code enforcement officer in cases of uncertainty can make a determination, it may well be, especially with respect to the shoreland zone, where we're very concerned with the most restrictive use because that's what the state says we're supposed to do and that's what our ordinance says we're supposed to do, that it's not as clear cut as saying we can delegate that, that to the administrator. I think there may be a higher standard he's got to meet in that regard. Second issue is we do have this oddity of the Mr. Goldman saying, I put these steps in so I can get access to the shore. And attempting, it appears, to fit under the space and bulk standard for shoreland zones, subsection F at the very end, which says you can do that, but then has very specific requirements that say that it can't be more than four feet wide and you can't have any other alternative. So that's a somewhat separate issue than, the, and what's important to me is that section, subsection F, does not say this only applies with respect to the 75 foot setback. It says notwithstanding anything up above, which are the space and bulk, bulk regulations for the entire zone, not simply the 75 foot setback. So that's a slightly different issue. Again, I think if you, if you correctly conclude the 20% holds, it's a non-issue. It's a, it's kind of superfluous to, to what happened here. So, what, so getting back to the to how you calculate the lot, you can look at <coughs> this calculation here. I don't you, know that I have that right here. Um, this plan. I know it's in the record. This part of it was in the record. This is it. On it's the very first appeal, which I was. Uh, yeah, we just can't read it on our... All right, what you will find on this is that directly above the bar, the graph showing here, yep. there is a statement that says uh, area, and it states in very small print, the area of the lot is 17,534 square feet. Below that, in somewhat larger language, it says allow the lot coverage. And it gives a calculation, 17,534 square feet times 0 0.20 equals 3,506.8 square feet limit. And this was done with 100% of the lot within the shoreland over there. Absolutely, so we know that. was a potential kind of offer. Yes, we know that because that up above it says the full lot that's the amount, which Mr. Mitchell agrees is the area of the lot. Gotcha. Um, and then below that statement, just above the graphic scale, there's a statement, proposed coverage 3,504.28 square feet. So he's got essentially two square feet of impervious surface of leeway. And we know that when Mr. Mitchell came along and wanted to put stairs in this property, that he put at least 292 square feet of new stairs down here. And we also why does that, that count? Pardon me? Why does that count as impervious surface? Why do the stairs count as impervious surface? Because mm -hmm. Mr. Mitchell tells us they do. And they are impervious. They're stone. Um, Ms. And do we know that everything that's on this plan was built as it's shown on here? That all of those structures are there? Yes. And I think you can, well, I haven't gone out and measured them bit by bit, but the code enforcement office issued a certificate of occupancy for that building after it was built in accordance with the plans, gotcha. after the planning board approved the dimensions. This should be in your packet. This was Ms. Costigan's yep. uh, submission to you. And these are the stairs we're talking about. These are the 292 square feet, as Mr. Mitchell describes them, of impervious surface. 
That's added to what's already on the lot. And what's already on the lot, as shown in 2005, does not show other things that we do know are on the lot, which are the stairways on either side and the eaves, which are shown in this photograph. So, like I say, my calculation is you're many, many hundreds of square feet beyond the 3,507 square foot limit. You were back then. You're far, far over it now. Um, I don't think there's any way to conclude that the square footage has somehow been reduced. Uh, look at the Google Maps and you'll see that there are structures everywhere that the plans show there are structures, and there are more structures appear to be stone patios elsewhere. So I thought there was some number. removal of patios or something like that, but I'm, is there any, has there been any kind of professional that's gone out and said, here's what the impervious surface we, is now? We have asked the code enforcement officer if he would make that determination. And the code enforcement officer has been reluctant to do that. I don't blame him. Um, so that's a dilemma that any abutter has when you don't have access to the property. I'd love to go hire a surveyor to go get an accurate measurement, but I can't do that. I would hope the town, if it's a real issue, would use its authority to enforce the zoning ordinance to go out and make those determinations if those are critical to what you're going to decide. I think the Zoning Board of Appeals has the authority to make those, to order those kind of determinations. Um, I'd be happy to have you tell somebody to do it. But again, on the face of it, the, the big picture is it's a no-brainer. There's no looking at Mitchell's map and how he cuts off roughly half of the garage here, the driveway, the walkway, the patio, eliminates all those. Those are all impervious surfaces that, that should be counted. Um, and or not. How much of, what is the square footage just on the garage roof that's cut off? Leaving out the eaves and kind of all that stuff that I think is... Oh, uh, this is 26.8 uh, plus 8, so that's about 34 and a half feet, 34 and 34 feet, feet in, from <coughs> the outside of the foundation on one side to the foundation for the posts, which hold up a kind of a walkway on the other side. And in depth, it is 25.8 feet um, from, again, the front line of the foundation to the back line of the foundation. And again, I suggest to you those, are, those don't count the eaves, they don't count the sheathing of the shingles and the insulation and so forth, which expands that. I think one of the pictures shows a heating structure there uh, attached to the side of that garage, which, again, is impervious surface attached to the, to the building, shadows the ground. So. There's, there are plenty of square footage of impervious services to be found on that property by anyone who wants to examine it, well above the limit allowed by the ordinance. Any other questions at this time? Sorry, just one quick question. In, among the many papers, pieces of paper that we have. We have one map that has red text on it. Yes. Is that submitted by the Murphys or not? No, that was submitted by the uh, Goldmans. Thank you. That's the, and, that's the final Mitchell plan after the, his se several iterations. And, and so on this map, you don't agree, the Murphys do not agree with the determination that it's 19.6? Oh, absolutely not, because you'll see that that map doesn't. OK. I, you, OK. You, I, <laughs> Sorry. Don't to be so vociferous. I do have copies of the Summerwind opinion, if anyone would like to see that, and the Nardi opinion, if you'd like that as well. I'll pass those. Yes, please. More paperwork to look at. And one, one more question on the the, the stairs on the left, which are the stone, the stone, the kind of loose stone steps on the left yep. hand side. Mm -hmm. um, if those were simply on the property and rearranged into stair form, would that still count as impervious surface? I believe so, because it's just like I put a piece of concrete out there. I've arranged them for a purpose, which is to create a pathway. Um, so it's an artificial uh, construction.
Anything else? If not, Hi, my name is Deborah Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road, and I do appreciate all your effort um, to the chairman and to all of you um, and all here. I wanted to talk to, and if I pronounce your name wrong, please forgive me, Michael Tadima Wellent. Yes. Close. When you talked about the uncertainty, and I believe it's 1924, where it talks about if it's at the property line, it is the property line. If it's at the center line, it's at the center line. That came out of Chapter 1000 guidelines. But when you talk about the uncertainty, it does tell you that you have to go to the scale of the map. You mentioned a scale of one inch equals 2,500 feet as if that was not a very um, accurate map. Or uh, actually, you've got a difference of plus or minus two feet. So if your code enforcement office is going out and you're looking at, first of all, the zoning map to see whether or not a lot is entirely within a zone or not, or where the district boundary falls, the landward boundary falls, you have a little play in that. It's built into the wording, center line of road, property line, but you can't move it 60 and 70, and in some cases in our neighborhood, not at this lot, but in other places, potentially, if this were allowed to occur, 121 feet. And this lot, it's 60, what is it, 67 feet? That isn't in the purview of an administrator or ordinance on a lot by lot basis to go through a neighborhood, this lot and any other lot in the neighborhood. I mean, if you say yes to this lot, that you can move that, what's going to happen on the lot next door and the lot next door and the lot next door? I bought my property looking at Cape's zoning map and knowing that what was across the street from me was entirely in the shoreland zone. As easy as you can say that the code enforcement officer can go out and determine the location of the normal high water line, if you refer to the map, it, it appears that the map has been ignored. And not only by, and I'm not saying Ben, not only by the, the code enforcement officers of the past, but also by Northeast Civil. But they weren't ignored by TICCOM. If you take the district boundary as it is shown on the map at the property line at the road and you measure 250 feet to the shore, guess where you end up? You end up at the top of the bank at the normal high water line. Why is it okay to measure from one direction and not the other? The map prevails. The uncertainty is if you're going to have something in your text and this comes out of the State Planning Office CEO Training Guide 2008. It has not been updated. It still stands. The uncertainties that our CEOs are trained to pay attention to are at a tax, tax map and lot number basis. And the, the measurement is such as footage from the district boundary to, say, the center line of a road. It's a short distance. You have a scale of a map dictated by the state, a minimum standard that says it shall be this scale. It's a graphical scale, as Nick had said, so that it can be reduced and enlarged without affecting the accuracy of where it is located on the face of the earth. I do feel it's very important to understand that an administrator, if allowed to move this outside of the scale of the map, outside of plus or minus a couple feet, say it's plus or minus three feet. If you allow that, then 
unbeknownst to all property owners in the town of Cape Elizabeth, our map is not going to change, and none of us are going to know it. And furthermore, in the proceedings for the new definition that took place, that was adopted September 11, 2014, I did not miss one workshop, one planning board meeting, one planning board workshop, town council. I went to everything. And I was very concerned that what would happen with this text definition, that, that a text definition might be used to shift the zone and that the public wouldn't know about it. And I wasn't the only one in the public concerned about that. There wasn't one person in the public that understood that fully, that agreed that the zone should shift. And in fact, the planning board stated that they did not want the map to change. They didn't feel it would change. That the definition only provided our code enforcement officer with a scientific way to find the starting point that we already have. If that's true, and our map did not change, neither did our zone. So measure from the district boundary on the landward side and go 250 feet towards the water and then give your little play, figure out where it is on the water side. Um, this is based, this is a Google Earth shot based on data from Judy Colby George, that yellow section, which you have a picture of this, that is our shoreland zone today. It is based on her data, it is her data set, and it's just overlaid onto this image. It's very accurate. It was based on a hand-drawn shoreland zone. When our shoreland zone was created, really thorough job. They could have just adopted the state minimum standards, like a lot of towns did. They didn't. They painstakingly decided, you know what? We have a lot of rocky ledges. We have some um, uh, estuarian wetlands. We're going to really take a good hard look. And actually, the Maine Municipal Association, through the townsmen, suggested strongly that every municipality do that. We should be really thankful that our town did that. If they were so careful in deciding that they were going to use something more restrictive than the state minimum standard, which is what they did, why would we not think that they weren't real careful with the map and how the map was displayed and how the map data came, came about? It was hand-drawn. They approved it. it hasn't, the shoreland zone hasn't changed since then. So, I, the, the Goldman lot is totally within the shoreland zone. It's never been removed from it. Our town council said over and over again through the new definition um, proposal, uh, every meeting, every hearing, that their intent was never to make our shoreland zoning less restrictive. To shift the zone seaward makes it less restrictive. That wasn't their intent and they did not update the map. Um, and the green up here, that's my property. It does overlap here. This is the existing shoreland zone. This, is, this line right here is where Mr. Mitchell's drawing, probably based on um, Northeast Civil, I'm not sure, but his drawing shows as a landscape architect um, not a land surveyor, where the starting point is. And this right here is the line um, showing where he thinks the district boundary should be, disregarding what the map shows. This is the line that the map shows. So all of this area, this blue line are, is their property line. All of this is not included in the calculation for lot coverage. And I want to also point out that the driveway, although it looks like it's crushed gravel, it's asphalt underneath, it's deck the stone is put on top of it. So, um, and when you look at the pictures of the construction of the stairs, pay close attention to the drainage pipes that allow the stormwater runoff that's causing acidification of our oceans. Just take a look at the pipes that allow that runoff to just run off a whole lot easier towards the ocean. So, um, 
please pay attention to the scale of the map. It's important. And um, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chairman Carver and ZBA board members. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say has already been said, but I prepared mine uh, separate from Nick's, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, say it anyway. So, if you are just going to be repeating stuff, can you go over it quickly? Because we've already been going on for. Sure. If, if it's just simply repeating what we've already heard. Sure, sure. Yeah. So the uh, building permit 130056 was for a, quote, new accessory structure, quote, exterior stairs. Project description was for a set of exterior stairs located on a steep slope on the southerly side of the residence. Um, the new stairs, uh, approximately 12 by 19 feet, exceed the maximum width of four feet per section 196, E2F that states, uh, notwithstanding the requirements stated above, stairways or similar structures may be allowed to provide shoreline access in areas of steep slopes, provided that the structure is limited to a maximum of four feet in width and that the applicant demonstrates that no reasonable alternative exists on the property. Please note in the transcripts from previous hearings, the Goldmans have twice stated that the purpose of the stairs is for shoreline access and that there is already uh, stairs on the easterly side of the lot providing access to the same area thereby satisfying the reasonable alternative requirement you have photos yeah additionally as stated the lot did not have any lot coverage balance remaining or available to use and the ordinance does not support a permit to add anything that increases lot coverage on a non-conforming lot, which this is. And section 19.4.1, article four of non-conformance intent states, except as otherwise provided a non-conforming condition shall not be permitted to be more non-conforming. Uh, per the Goldman's original building plans for their residence uh, as per site plan A100 by Titcom Associates dated 2005, the balance of lot coverage remaining after construction of said residence was 2.52 square feet. Of course, this calculation doesn't include the stairs or steps on the southeasterly corner of the residence and the uh, other existing stairwells to the lower portion of the lot. The lot is entirely within the shoreland zone as our official zoning map. The structure is non-conforming. Lot coverage exceeds 20% allowed per section 19.611E2 chart of maximum coverage. And the lot is non-conforming as it is only 80 feet wide and does not meet the minimum dimensions per section 19.611E2 chart minimum lot area minimum shore frontage. Also, section 1944B5, non-conforming accessory structure uh, condensed states on a non-conforming lot of record on which only a residential structure exists, the code enforcement officer may issue a permit to place a single accessory structure with no utilities for the storage of yard tools and similar equipment. Obviously, the stairs do not meet this purpose, but in case they did, the ordinance continues on to state that such accessory structure shall not exceed 80 feet in square area, or 80 square feet in area, uh, nor 8 feet in height, and shall be located as far back from the shoreline as practical and shall meet all other applicable standards, including lot coverage. In no case shall the lot be located closer to the shoreline than the principal structure. And lastly, just 
I would like to cite some of the following definitions and sections for, uh, f within our ordinance for the record. And those are definitions uh, in 19.1.3 for accessory building or structure, impervious area or impervious service, increase in nonconformity of a structure, lot coverage, structure, variance, and zoning map definitions. And sections 19.611, 19.611E2F, 1941, 1944B5, uh, 19611 E2, all of the charts, and 1922, the zoning map, 1924, and 1926. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Go, please. Ms. Ms. Costa, um, yes, I'm sorry. you were speaking earlier yes. at a different application. You were going fairly quick. Okay, I'll I go slower. I find you difficult to follow at times. Okay. Please take your time. I'm not saying take excessive time, but just speak <laughs> I, a little slower. I will go slower. Can I move this laptop? Is this fence? Thank you. Okay. Mary Costigan, I'm here tonight on behalf of Kathy and Marshall Goldman, the owners of 27 Pilot Point Road. Um, I'm going to walk through this, if you can bear with me, just a little bit more sort of straightforward and answer the following questions in this order because it, I think it's really important. So first is where's the normal high water line? Second is are the steps are located within 75 feet of that normal high water line? Third, where is the boundary of the Shoreline District as it relates to 27 Pilot Point Road? And fourth, does the impervious coverage on that portion of the lot within the Shoreline District exceed 20%? And that's the, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of pieces, but it really comes down to those four basic questions. Um, so we have four basic questions, we have a lot of information, and we've had three years have gone by. So I'm gonna, I will point you to a letter um, that I wrote last September, so September, there's actually two letters dated September 17th, just because of the timing of this. One is 2013, one is 2014. The one dated September 17th, 2014, has a timeline of sort of where we have been and how we got here. So starting with the question of where is the normal high water line, um, earlier when Mr. Bryant was going through the findings of the board from October 23rd, he left out one very important finding, which is this board agreed with the code enforcement officer's finding that the normal high water line was as depicted on the map. Um, John, if you could, could you hang up those two plans? I meant to have him do that while I was doing this, and then I'll refer to those. Um, so Bruce Smith, the code enforcement officer at the time, went and made a, vis made a visual determination of where the um, normal high water line was at the time. Um, if I, I believe it, at least one of you is around in, on the, in the October 2012 meeting. Um, it just so happened at that meeting there was an application for the neighboring property as well. So there was a long discussion of the mean high water line and uh, Mr. Smith had made the same determination for the two neighboring properties. And the board quickly, when it was time for the Goldman application, quickly made the conclusion, like, said, yes, we agree, it's, it's what uh, uh, Bruce found, um, and we agree that it's, it's not necessarily, the top of the bank is not a default, that the code enforcement officer has um, the discretion under the ordinance to, to make a determination of what the um, furthest extent of the tide was under the definition at the time. And so that, um, was made, did you put up, do you have the original one too? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, that one. So, so John Mitchell just hung up two different plans. The one on the left is the original plan that was submitted with the application in 2012. And so I'll talk about that one first with uh, Bruce's determination. Uh, this 
line right here it says high water mark as determined by uh, Bruce Smith, Code Enforcement Officer, on August 15, 2012. And that's that line down here. Um, and so in October of 2012, this board found that it was indeed the high water mark. Um, and we agree with that. We, um, we disagree with the fact that um, the definition required that the top of the bank be the uh, normal high water mark. Um, we understand there was a 2005 um, survey. We are not bound by that survey. This is a different application. It's a different survey. Um, and as, as you're aware, there was a lot of uncertainty in that definition. And because of that, the town made a decision to, to change that definition and, and make it more certain. Mr. Bryant referred to a, a, a law court case, Mack versus Town of Cape Elizabeth, and I will note that in that case, the court specifically found that the, um, there was a typographical error in the definition where IE should have been EG, and that top of the bank was only an example, and that the normal high water line could have been lower than the top of the bank, and in this case, Bruce Smith found so. Now, what happened in 2012 at the Board of Appeals meeting was that first the board found that that was the normal high water mark. And then came to the point of saying, okay, well, where's that line of the 250 feet? If you measure from there, well, that's different than what the map is showing. And what do we do about that? And that's where the confusion came in. Um, and that's where the sort of the confusing finding came where you found that based on the map, the 250 feet included the entire property, but it was unclear enough that you didn't think that Bruce made an error. Um, and so the discussion at the time in October of 2012 was when somebody finds themselves in that position where the 250 feet as measured from the normal high water line does not match up to the zoning map, you have to go to the the code enforcement officer and request an opinion as to what the actual boundary was. So following that October 2012 decision, that's what we did. We sent a letter to Ben McDougall um, after we had Jim Fisher of Northeast Civil Solutions go out and do a determination of the normal high water mark. Now you referred earlier to that plan that, that Jim did. And Jim then took the measurement from that normal high water mark and measured 250 feet. Jim is well aware of the rules. He does work all over the state. And like anywhere else in the state, the most places, I would say Raymond has a 600 foot shoreland zone, but we're not there. Um, you measure 250 feet from that normal high water mark. And that's how you get your shoreland zone, period. Um, the town last year, um, in its amendments um, not only changed the definition of normal high water mark, they added a provision, and I want to read it right to you so it's clear, that, and it's now in section 16, 19611A, the town has prepared, prepared a zoning map showing the shoreland performance overlay district based on the best available information at a town-wide scale. The actu actual boundaries of this district, however, shall be determined by physical features present on the site that are included in the shoreland performance overlay district as defined above. So in other words, it's just an estimate on the map and you have to go out in the field and determine where the starting point is and where the end point is. And that's, where, that's how it works everywhere else in the, in the state. Um, so. I'm going to go back to the first question, which is, where is the normal high water line? And the reason why I just went off on a little tangent is the reason why we had Ben then, I mean, Jim Fisher come out and do it again and have Ben verify, and which is why you have a little bit of a variance in, in your paperwork. And the difference is, hopefully you can see here, you, you have both of these sheets. This line is Bruce's line. This line is Ben's line. 
you see this red here, see how it's just that straight across? That's the 250 feet when we first applied. This is the 250 feet from Ben's line. So it actually added, it actually went land here, and it added more of the garage. So when we followed the ordinance provision and requested a, a finding by the code enforcement officer of what is the boundary of the 250 foot shoreland zone, this is the answer. Which is why there are also new calculations. I will also add that in November of 2012, there was an interim code enforcement officer. Um, there's an email on the record from Mr. Mike McGovern, um, also stating that confirming the determination of the normal high water line, and also going further to say that the shoreline district is as measured 250 feet from that line. So we have three code enforcement officers telling us that the normal high water line is as measured from a visual interpretation, and the, la the line of the shoreland zone is measured 250 feet from there. The final thing I will note about the normal high water line, particularly um, with respect to the 75 feet, and I'll, I'm going to get to that next, is that. As you know, the, the zoning ordinance is now changed, and there's a very specific definition of what the normal high water line is. We didn't go through that exercise of measuring it because that wasn't the, the definition at the time. But just something to consider because we have to also be practical. If we were to apply today, there's no question that those stairs are not within 75 feet of the normal high water line. Um, as, as the definition stands today. The, really, the only difference of opinion is whether that 250-foot line can be measured from the normal high water line, as is defined in the ordinance, or whether you have to go by a very high-scale map and not go by what's actually on the ground, which is how everybody else measures it, of what's exactly on the ground. So the answer to question one, I'm going to just repeat for the sake of uh, clarity. Where is the normal high water line? The normal high water line as determined by the CEO pursuant to the section in your ordinance that resolves inconsistencies. Is that right there? And this was provided to you with both uh, my September 17, 2013 letter and September 17, 2014 letter. That line is on, on both of those um, application submissions. And then if you measure 75 feet from the normal high water line, the stairs are clearly outside of that 75 foot mark. The next question is where is the boundary of the shoreland district as it relates to 27 Pilot Point Road? And I've, I've covered a lot of this. The definition of the shoreland district is defined as all land was defined as, it's a little different now, but at the time, it was defined as all land within 250 feet horizontal distance of the upland edge of a coastal wetland, including all areas affected by tidal action, such as cobble and sand beaches, mud flats, and rocky ledges. At the time, it was interpreted as a normal high water line, all of that stuff at the end there, and actually today, that's what it says. It's 250 feet of the normal high water line. Um, it doesn't say or otherwise depicted on the zoning map. It says 250 feet from the normal high water line. And 250 feet from the normal high water line is right here. The other thing I wanted to note about the, the discussion about the zoning map, what you have to remember is that we're talking about the shoreland zone, 
And Cape Elizabeth doesn't have a separate shoreland zoning ordinance, it just has a zoning ordinance. So at the very beginning, when you're talking about districts, that's a discussion about all the districts. And when you're talking about a commercial district, a residential district, those districts are not measured by 250 feet from a line. They are, you know, that neighborhood there from that road to that road to that road. So of course, when you're talking about how a boundary should follow a road or it should follow a property line, it completely makes sense with your average district. It just doesn't make sense with a shoreland district. And that is why with shoreland districts, you measure from the field and you verify and you get the code enforcement officer to verify that the distance is 250 feet from the normal high water line. Otherwise, everything else in the shoreland zone about the 20% coverage and everything else that happens within that zone, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And why would you talk about 20% of a portion of a lot that's within the shoreland zone if what you really mean is any lot that's in the zone, you measure the entire lot. It just doesn't make sense. It is a very, very precise measurement, and it should be treated as such. So now we get to the 20%. So now that we've shown you that the 250-foot line, now we take all that red that's within that zone, and we calculate the impart risk coverage. Now what happened in, this was September of 2013, right before we had a hearing, um, actually I think it was the day of the hearing, Mr. Bryant submitted to the town and copied us that chart that he gave you of his measurements taken from photos. And what we did that day is we actually, um, John Mitchell and I and, uh, Mr. Marshall, as well as Ben McDougall, went out to the site and did actual measurements. Um, and the result of those actual measurements is what was provided you to you last year, these measurements here in this box. So on this chart with solid red, you have the measurements that were taken from the photos that were taken last And what we did was we took that um, chart that Mr. Bryant did and we went through all of the numbers and actually measured them on site. The biggest area of disagreement, um, there were two areas. One, the garage didn't come out right. He had um, 374.6 and we came out with 332. Um, and we actually measured the actual eaves as opposed to measuring the gravel strips because the gravel strips are wider and the gravel strips are pervious. And the actual eaves come out to 194 square feet. Um, and the third area where there was a, a, a larger discrepancy was he took the, the measurement of the new stairs um, and left out the fact that there were grass landings as opposed to stone. So his measurement was 295 and what ours was 181. So taking all those numbers into account, um, we just make it. We squeak in there, but we just make it. And it was, we took everything that he measured and went out there and measured it. And we came up with an over balance of 58.2 square feet. So we are within the 20% um, based on a very careful determination by a landscape architect with the code enforcement officer on site. Question for you. Were the two stairs, stone stairs on, on either side of the house, that Mr. Bryant referenced included in, in those calculations you did? Whatever is in red, so I'm gonna ask John. To Which I would assume it would just be individual stone. John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates, yes they were. Uh, both sets of stairs. Uh, the one set of stairs on the left are actual pieces of ledge that yeah. have been placed into, into the, uh, the slope and the set of stairs on the right are just short pieces of granite, again, set into the slope with grass landings. Thank you. Um, just on that note, I, I will mention that... Uh, Dustin, can I yes. talk for a second? Yeah. Could you go back, because I, I, I missed that part. You mentioned sure. there were three differences. In the okay. Population. What was the third area? So uh, the garage 
there, there was a garage. There was the, we measured the actual roof eaves as opposed to measuring the gravel strips because the gravel strips are wider. I believe actually if you picture number eight, you can actually see that the eave is more narrow. It doesn't come out as far as the actual gravel strip. Um, so that was a big difference. That was a difference between over 300 and uh, 194. And then the third was the, um, the, the new stairs. The, we actually changed the original application to have them grass landings, and he had those as, uh, as uh, impervious. I see. Thank you. Um, just one note is that, I mean, these are all very, it's a very conservative measurement. We measured everything, including natural ledge. And under the um, definition of impervious coverage, it is the total area of a parcel that consists of buildings and associated constructed facilities. And natural ledge is not a constructed facility. Um, if, and I, I, I think if you just move something that's already naturally existing and maybe make it in the form of a step, I, I, I don't think that should count, although we did count it. So we, we've counted everything that we can, and we've still come up with these numbers that are up here. And we, so we fall within the 20%. Of, yes, please, please do. I, I just want to make a point to the board that uh, you know, I, I do these calculations all the time on a regular basis. And you know, I'm very careful in these calculations. Um, we use the sources that we use to calculate the impervious surface. Uh, there was a, uh, an as-built site plan that we used. We used the uh, architectural plans for the home. Um, we used my construction documents for the set of stairs, uh, as well as field measurements. There were some areas that, uh, uh, that required us to go out and actually measure uh, the impervious surfaces, which we did. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, a lot of the items that Mr. Bryant mentioned that we didn't include, we did include uh, the set of stairs, the eaves. Um, so I just want to point that out. And uh, one other thing, and I think it's, it's really misleading to point to this plan <coughs> and, uh, and say that we exceeded the impervious surface. He's using a, a calculation that was prepared by others um, and uh, and it was a, it's a different uh, they used a, a different shoreland zone district, so it's it's misleading to refer to this plan. Thank you. Before you go away, um, do you know whether if the entire lot was within the shoreland zone, if the percentage would be over twenty percent? I haven't done that calculation, but I, I think it would be uh, because you'd, you'd be including the entire driveway. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, My next question was for Attorney Costigan. So I also would list down a question with him. Would you like to go? If you don't mind. <laughs> um, can you talk about. Um, the summer wind line of cases and kind of the precedent in Maine for there being the ability to locate shoreland zones versus other zones um, via ordinance language differently from how they're shown on zoning maps. Right. Um, I have not read summer wind lately, although it was our case. And I don't remember this as being a, a directly on point. Um, and the other case dealt with resource protection zones, which are not the same. They are, you know, they're defined as, you know, having certain habitats and having other certain things. They're not a strict 250 feet from this point, boom, that's your zone. Um, and so to me, and I apologize, I did not read Summer Wind today, um, but to my knowledge, in my experience, Almost, I hate to say all because there may be an exception, but all the towns, to my knowledge, that I've dealt with measure shoreland zones for particular applications on a case by case basis. I think that what I'm looking for is yeah. not necessarily a discussion of what towns are actually doing, yeah, like in Portland, <laughs> but right. what is permissible under the law in terms sure. of is it generally a principle that the law court has upheld that the 
district boundaries, regardless of whether they're shoreland districts or residential districts or commercial districts or industrial districts, how those are shown on zoning maps um, is the district versus how they're spelled out in the ordinance. I think with a shoreland zone, it's the exception. And the reason it's the exception is the definition is very clear. It, when the definition is very clear in the ordinance and has a meets and bounds, which is 250 feet from the normal high water mark, the code enforcement officer can make an interpretation as to where the lines are. And that's the difference between, as I said, a commercial zone that ends on Shore Road versus an exact meets and bounds measurement from a starting point to an end point. And when that's clear in the ordinance, which is very clear in your ordinance how to define the shoreland zone boundary, then, then you, you do have the ability to take that measurement separately and, and define it that way, even though it is different than what it may appear on the map. But doesn't our ordinance provide the code enforcement officer with that discretion only when it's unclear? when it's inconsistent, and in this case it's inconsistent, what's shown on the map and the definition. It, what's shown on the map and this is different. Let me get the exact language. Where uncertainty exists as to the location of any zoning district boundary, so it's uncertainty. Yep. And regardless of what the, or does it matter what the ordinance says, I guess is kind of my fundamental question. Are we bound by the zoning ordinance and do we have the ability to change a zoning map, sorry, via ordinance language? And if so, why? Well, it's not that you're, you're not changing a zoning map. The zoning map, the role of the map is it supposed to be the application of the language in the ordinance, okay? And so actually what gets changed first is the ordinance gets changed and then the map is supposed to be amended to follow that. And so here, I guess we could go and ask the town to amend the map on our property line and we would get an amendment, but it doesn't say we need to do that. Um, so they go, they're supposed to go hand in hand. And when they don't, you go to the code enforcement office and you say, why is, this is unclear. Why, why is there a difference here? Can you please make a determination as to what the boundary is? Does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. Um, you mentioned those three CEOs that provided an opinion. Is the second, the temporary CEO, has that document been provided to the board here? Yes. It was an email from November of 2012. It's in the packet. Uh, it's, is it part of the record or is it in the packet that we received? It's part of, the, it, it was submitted at, I, it, I think Somewhere it was submitted above. back in 2012. Okay. Um, the other issue that I had was Mr. Bryant raised uh, the remedy issue. Uh, and. I identified potentially five. Would you be able to respond on, uh, on each of them? Um, the viability of voiding the building permit, removing the stairs, resetting the high water line, a determination that the Goldman lot is in the shoreline overlay, uh, and whether the 20% uh, um, uh, uh, permeability uh, standard has been met. I think you've already touched on some of them, but could you just provide a summary on those five points? If I remember all of them. I mean, remedy is a really interesting thing here in this case because it's been three years, the stairs are in place, the zoning ordinance has changed, so there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle here. None of them add up to the stairs being removed, no matter what scenario you play, particularly with the fact that you have a new definition of the high water line and in no way are the stairs within 75 feet of that. So removal of the stairs, you, just for argument's sake, because we, t we completely believe that we are within the 20% the 20 rule, we could put pervious 
pavers in our driveway. It, there are ways that you can get to 20% without removing the stairs. Um, so from a remedy perspective, um, it's really not about the stairs. It's about impervious coverage. Um, so if that answers part of your question with regard to remedy, I don't know if I missed the other point. Um, the voting of the building permit was one. Voiding a building permit? I mean, it, it goes, I mean, again, it goes to the, the passage of time and what, what that actually means. Um, does voiding a building permit result in us having to take up, remove the stairs when we don't really don't have to do that to meet the 20%? Um, we have new standards in place. Nobody's done the measurements with the new standards. It's possible we meet the 20% under the new rule. I don't know. We're giving clear guidance in the new ordinance that the 250-foot measurement is measured in the field and we don't go by the zoning map. That's really clear. Um, so no matter how you play it out, um, the stairs can stay. And we can, if we have to, which we don't think we do, if we had to play with the impervious coverage, there's plenty to play with. Thank you. I'm Marshall Goldman. Uh, I'm the one mentioned before. Uh, we've been doing this for about three years. I know some, I know some of you from uh, the last hearing. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I mean, uh, uh, I think that the, uh, my sense of, of, of this issue with respect to the, the legal issue, I, I don't stand before you as an attorney, so I wouldn't, wouldn't presume uh, to do this. Uh, I actually, you know, we've lived here now for about 15 years. My wife is from the area. That's why we're here. Um, I am in the construction business uh, and familiar with uh, dealing with cities. I was actually on the city council in Cupertino, so I was familiar with some of the things that you do, and so I appreciate your time and effort. And I know it's been a long time. Uh, I'd make just a couple points. Is if at any, if really the imper first of all, at the first hearing, which was with the Livingstons, and then we were heard, it was made clear that the, where the line of the ocean was. And in fact, the attorney uh, for, uh, for the Murphys at that point, I think, got up, you know, on, on, the, on the second hearing and said, well, it's kind of a moot point now. I mean, it's with respect to how close the steps are to the ocean. The impervious surface is an issue that came after as, for whatever reason, I don't know. I can't tell you. I don't know why we're doing this. I honestly don't. If someone had come to me and said, we don't like those granite steps were unhappy about that. We would have said, fine, we will work with you. We don't care. We're not trying to do anything. We're not trying to get away with anything. We're not trying to do anything incorrectly. With respect to when we began the project, we began the project only after this board had upheld our permit. And I had waited and I had contacted the city manager about 15 days later and I said, can I proceed or not? There was no intent on our part. And in fact, if you look at the history of it, every time an appeal was issued on this thing, it was like the day before the deadline. So, you know, what could we do? With respect to the idea of whether there's steps, how many sets of steps down, the property or not. I mean, that's kind of a, a matter of judgment. The, uh, there's a little path right over here. It doesn't go all the way down, but it's there. I agree. There's four, there's four stones that we actually placed when we bought the property. We'll take them out. If, that's, if that'll make somebody happy, we'll be happy to do it. Seriously, I mean, I don't, we're, it's a puzzlement to us. 
Um, we've worked with every city official that we could. We've asked the questions. We asked for a determination as we're entitled to. We got that. Um, and um, we just like to move forward if we can. But we appreciate your time and effort. And it's a little bit late. Thank you. Uh, rebuttal from the Murphys? It is very late. I will be as brief as I can. <clears throat> a couple things I would point out. With respect to the point that has been three years since this matter was first brought up, the Murphys appealed the issuance of the permit initially within the 30-day time period. The reason it's taken three years, apart from a few medical issues towards last fall and family, is that this board has three times failed to properly enforce the zoning ordinance by granting the Murphy's appeal. Three times this board has been reversed by the Superior Court. It hasn't been that the Murphy's have been dilatory in pursuing enforcement of the ordinance, as is the right as the butter. It's because, as with a number of other cases involving this board, not Mr. Goldman, but other properties along the, <clears throat> the shore that were all initially um, instigated as a result of the willy-nilly handing out of what I consider to be invalid permits by the former code enforcement officer, this board has been facing appeal after appeal after appeal. And what's been frustrating from the Murphy's perspective is that they've been doing everything they can to say, look, all we're asking is that you enforce the ordinance. This is what the ordinance says. This is what the code enforcement officer did. They don't mesh. Your job is to act on that. And three times now, you have denied the Murphy's appeal on grounds. With all due respect, this appeal third? was initially filed going on a year ago, and we've been meeting every month. And what was happy the third time you've been reversed? There have been three separate appeals. <clears throat> the initial Superior, appeal of the building Superior permit. Superior Court appeals? Yeah. It was remanded down to us. We, <clears throat> we had another hearing at which you decided we had no standing to appeal. That was the second. That was the second. There was a separate appeal that we had to file separately to protect interests with respect to the subsequent determination by the code enforcement officer. And in fact, on your agenda tonight are two different appeals that were both heard at the same time by the Superior Court and overturned you in both cases because you denied us standing in both of those appeals. So don't put this on the Murphys. Now, with respect to Mr. Goldman's point. We move forward to the substance of the matter because we've been here for a couple of hours at this point. Yeah, well, remedy is one of the important issues here. And I think that the board should know that Maine law does not give Mr. Goldman a vested right in these stairs that he's expended money on. And he doesn't have that right until the appeal periods expire. So he took, made the decision, I'm going to build these steps, even though the appeal periods haven't expired. He may have done it based upon misinformation from the town, but that's his call, not the Murphy's uh, issue. And so it seems to me the permit, if you determine um, that the shoreland zone indeed covers what the map says it covers, that the permit was issued in violation of the ordinance, and your job under the obligations and duties of the ordinance is to enforce compliance with the ordinance, to review the decisions of the code enforcement officer and enforce the ordinance in accordance with its terms. Um, and the only other substantive point I'd make out is you can't look at the cases like Summer Winds um, and conclude that the text controls it's the map that controls. The law court is clear. There's a line of cases that says it's a legislative duty of the, uh, of the town council, and that's what your ordinance says is how we define zoning districts. Thank you. Any further comments from the Goldmans? I'm just going to get my pen. <laughs> and any public comment? Oh, I didn't know there it is. All right, hearing no public comment, um, we'll open it up for board discussion.
What topic would you like to talk about first? <coughs> um. <coughs> I don't care. The normal high water line. I, I mean, that, that's probably where it starts for me. Right. Yeah, yeah, actually. Uh, I, I just wanted to make one comment. Uh, Mrs. Murphy stated that the Shoreland Zone line is Judy Colby George's line and that it's an accurate line. Uh, I have a, a memo here from Judy Colby George that's somewhat contrary to that. I don't know if you want it read right into the record or. Yes, or, please. I thought it was prudent because it was contrary to testimony. Uh, this is a memo to Maureen O'Meara, town of Cape Elizabeth, from Judy Colby George, date January 16th, 2014, RE, origin and accuracy of shoreland zoning GIS data. I am writing this memo in response to your questions about the origins and accuracy of the town of Cape Elizabeth's shoreland zoning GIS data layer. First, I should state that I did not create this data layer. It was created by Chris Summers at Greater Portland Council of Governments sometime around 1994. All I can speak to is what I know in general about how Greater Portland Council of Governments and most everyone else created data at that time period. The base layer upon which the shoreland zoning was developed was the parcel data created from the town's tax maps and fit to the USGS seven and a half minute quad sheets for road center line and water bodies. These parcels were created on uncontrolled aerial photography, meaning that the scale and accuracy of the data changed across the photo depending on elevation shifts and tilt of the plane when the photography was taken. Each individual tax sheet was then updated for any number of years without any control. These individual tax sheets were fit together into a single composite to the best of the cartographer's ability. But overall, the accuracy of the parcel data was unknown and unknowable. It varies across the town depending on many factors. Once the parcel base map was created, the shoreland zoning was created using a series of data sets, including Cumberland County soils, FEMA flood zones, and buffers from the parcel edges. It is my belief that at the time of the creation of the Cape Elizabeth Shoreland Zoning Map, all of these data layers were created from existing paper maps and also fit to the base map. Understanding the limitations of the data is very important to using it appropriately. Some data layers have specific accuracy. For instance, the USGS seven and a half minute quad sheets adhere to national map accuracy standards which states that 90% of the features must be within 40 feet of their location on Earth, and 90% of vertical features must be within one half contour interval of their actual elevation. Data layers compiled from multiple and unknown sources, it, it is impossible to list a specific accuracy standard. Taking paper maps and making them digital does not increase their inherent accuracy. It does create the ability to print the data at a variety of scales, which often provides a false sense of accuracy. Any map which shows a variety of layers cannot really be considered more accurate than its least accurate data layer. I cannot provide a specific accuracy representation of the data because I believe it is a variable accuracy. Accuracy also impacts on the costs of data preparation and maintenance Sometimes accuracy can't be improved on a particular data layer because of technological restrictions. More often, the, the accuracy is determined through balancing the needs of the end user and the cost to produce the data. Most communities develop data to an acceptable level of accuracy to accomplish the majority of tasks, assuming that there may be site-specific needs for more accurate data. In the case of shoreland zoning, especially the RP zone, most of the data needs to be field verified in order to determine the actual distribution of the natural resources which the community has agreed to protect. The value of this type of data is for providing planning level information 
which can be used to provide general guidance to the town and landowners that they should be aware of a specific regulation and engage the proper specialist to map their specific property. This type of data must be used in conjunction with the ordinance in order to determine the site-specific boundaries of the regulation. Uh, we're public board discussion now. Sorry. I think it's important that the board understand that what's included is not what is represented. It's talking about the the, 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 the comment is closed now. We're now on to board discussion. You had your opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ben. So let's get to the high water line. What are we using to determine that? I mean, we have Ben's. So the June 3rd, 2013, that went to the shoreland zone boundary determination. That's correct. But you are also using your March 1st visit with Northeast Civil Solutions. That's correct. For in that 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 established in your in your determination a high water line. Yes. Okay. And that was in response to the Goldman's request. Yeah, both okay. both of those were in response to the Goldman's request. I went out and determined the high water line based on the prior zoning definition on March first, two thousand thirteen, and subsequently they requested that I make a determination of the zoning boundary. So what what are the board's thoughts on that determination? The, for the, the high the high water I'm gonna use the term, term wrong. The normal high water line. It doesn't seem to me that there's a whole lot of dispute about the CEO having the ability to set that. Um, certainly I asked the Murphy's attorney whether he conceded that the CEO had the authority to set that and he said yes, he okay. did it and so, I'm in agreement. I, I, I think it's clear that the, the code enforcement officer has the ability to, to determine that. Okay. So let's just want to kind of walk through these like kind of develop findings as we go along so we don't have to kind of go back and we might have to go back and you know revise these as we make different determinations or if it seems like the board is going in different directions but I mean at least as kind of in these these draft determinations we have findings of fact and conclusions on the June 3rd, 2013 letter, and that's for the shoreland, that's for the zone itself. But after that, but sort of we're getting to it first, is the location of the normal high water line of coastal waters. So let's try to put together findings of fact with respect to the normal high water line of coastal waters. volunteer to suggest I'll do a rough I attempt. Type. Yeah. Uh, the code enforcement officer has the authority under section 1924 of the zoning ordinance 
to assess a normal high water mark? Normal high water line. Thank you. The normal high water. Um, I don't know if true. that's right either. I, I, yeah. I don't think that's the section that gives them that. That's location of district boundaries. And it would be true to the extent the normal high water mark is the boundary for the shoreline zone. Okay, so. But what that section, what 1924 does is authorize the code enforcement officer where uncertainty exists as to the location of any zoning district boundary to make a formal written determination of that boundary. I mean, do we want to include in findings of fact or conclusions of law restatement of the ordinance? I don't. I don't think we do, but I think we want to be clear about what the ordinance authorized. Okay. So, so okay. Where uncertainty exists. This is section 19. Two four. Two four. Two four of the zoning ordinance. Josh, where are you now? What's that? Where are you now? I'm writing where uncertainty exists as the location of any zoning district boundary and at the request of a property owner, section 1924 of the zoning ordinance permits the code enforcement officer. But is, I mean, is, that seems to just be restating. Do we? So how, how does he have the, when does he get the authority to make the determination? So only upon request, is that right? Right. Okay. I mean, that's where, but again, I, I feel like the fact is that the, the code enforcement officer determines the, I, that's what I think pursuant, how about pursuant to 19, two, four. Yeah. And at the request of the oh. Goldman's, the code enforcement officer made a written determination that of the, of the location of the normal high water line. Made a written determination of the location normal high water line. Adjacent to the adjacent to the Goldman Lotto, isn't it? Because that, that it was limited to just that. Well, on. Adjacent to Tax Map U twelve lot seven. What is that again? Tax map U twelve lot seventy. So 
if, if we're holding that. At, well, should we, I mean, should we specify as set forth? So this is, and where is that written? The high water line. This is the letter with respect to, was it, is it, are, are, yeah. so there's not a prior letter with respect to just the high water line? Correct. Okay. So pursuant to 1924 and at the request of the Goldmans, the code enforcement officer made a written determination of the location of the normal high water line adjacent to tax map U12 lot 70 as set forth in his June 3rd, 2013 letter. Yes. Um, Did you want to refer to a piece of evidence identifying that high watermark? Yes. How about? Civil Solutions Survey. Is that? That's this, right? Well, yeah. If you refer to the, yes, this one has Here. two purposes, not just the high watermark, right. but it has the well, coverage. Yes. Okay. So, but yeah. we can certainly use this for the high watermark. Yes. Yes. That's the location that you essentially yes yeah okay but it's just this is the same here that that is the same but this is the one this that was the survey produced the survey, the the survey that was produced okay. after I did that as set forth in his June 3rd 2013 letter and uh, and as shown on the March first, twenty thirteen, Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. Is that yes, specific mean, enough? Uh, as referred to in Ben's letter. As set forth in his June third, twenty thirteen letter, and and as shown. Yes, I missed that. Thank okay. You. Okay. All right. Um, Proposed motion is the normal high water line of coastal waters is accurate as determined by the code enforcement officer and as shown on the Northeast Civil Solutions Plan dated March 1st, 2013. Yes. I mean, I think we can have that as a finding of fact and then, you know, which goes along with that motion, you know, if the board is inclined to agree with that. I'm fine with that as well. I mean, do we need any other conclusions or findings of fact that relate to the normal high water line of coastal waters? Not the determining of line, we're good with that. And just um, so what we're, the appeal that we're talking about is the August 17, 2012 building permit issuance, right? I just think we should be careful to tie our findings yep. to the two items that are on appeal. And make sure that the dates all work. Yep. 
Um, With, I think what we're hearing is the appeal of Bruce Smith's issuance in August of 2012. So what are we doing if we're upholding Ben's yeah. 2013 well, it's, it's, determination? It, that's, there, that, that's another. Are, that's so also. Technically, are we overturning the August? I just, we just need no, to. No, you're right, you're right, you're right. Um, Bruce Smith never made a written determination. I think it's, as Attorney Brian Lyman mentioned, he, he obviously made that determination. Right, right. But never for us. But isn't there one map that shows it with Bruce's, the one on the left, and then it was revised, the one on the right for Ben's? Is that right? So on the map there, on the what the least restrictive is on the left. The more restrictive is on the right. So Correct. Bruce on the left, Ben on the right. Correct. Right. So if we approve Ben's letter of um, June 1st, 2013, I think, um, which would su supersede because it's more restrictive, mm -hmm. one on the right. Ben, no. what evidence do we have that Bruce has made it? We have a building permit. <laughs> I, I think we'd have to go back to the record of the original meeting, and I believe there may well, be something in that record. The findings of fact from that meeting. Um, you issued a building permit. On September the Merv twelve uh, appeal. I mean from these minutes it doesn't I mean the board agreed seven nothing that the proposed accessory structure is greater than seventy five feet from the normal high water line of coastal waters. But there's no holding there's no finding the fact or determination as to what yeah. it was so I'm looking at the first appeal the remand which one uh, from May 10th 2013 10th. or July and so the court says the ZBA will need to consider and determine the location of the high water line as that term is defined in section 19.13 of the ordinance. So by this, it doesn't say anything about code enforcement officers. Right. Determination of that. Where, what are you reading? Page three. So issues on the remand. Okay. In light of the remand, the court need not address the other issues raised in the appeal on the separate issue. The ZBA will need to determine, need to consider and determine the location of the normal high water line. Okay. Is that a memo from our attorney? What? Is that a memo? No, that's the um, order. Just the, okay. The, the Murphys contend that the most restrictive top of the bank section of the old definition should be used. Uh, I contend that you look further for apparent extreme effects of the tide, which I consider to be water staining on the rocks and, um, and, and possibly other features. So a, a, sub, a substantive question is, do you go to the most restrictive top of the bank or do you contemplate other aspects of that definition? Right, I mean like, I mean. It's clear that I don't consider top of the bank to be the controlling factor in that definition. It's clear that Bruce didn't 
consider that to be a controlling aspect of that definition. And, and the we, court on remand is saying it is therefore conceivable that the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tides could, could fall short of the top of the bank in a given case. Mm -hmm. And the definition is clear that you can look at a bunch of different factors. The definition of normal high water line in our ordinance. That's right. And, and the even the shoreland zone language regarding the um, top of the bank is IE language, right. so not EG language. Maybe our finding is just, we find that the normal high water line is that line as determined by well, the I mean, enforcement it, the, the other factor is no two people are going to walk down the rocks and point at the same location. Right. But I mean, so, but again, from the, the issue that was remanded to us from the May 10th, 2013 order was the ZBA will need to consider and determine the location of the normal high water line as that term is defined in section 19.13. That's what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. The date of the bands. You don't think it matters. I don't think that the date of the band is. Well, just, I, I mean, I think I was just including it so there's a clear reference. Oh, I know, but I think. Joanna raised a question. Are, are you concerned that it was after, it was after this remand? It's probably because his a determination. His determination has also been appealed. Right. So, so we're making it. I mean, here in the first remand, they were they were remanding the matter back to us to make that determination. Mm -hmm. A request was made. He made the determination. That was also appealed. Mm -hmm. So, but I think we get to that. I think we first need to make the determination. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And, and then we need a second, another finding or holding or conclusion that up, upholding that, presumably, mm -hmm. if, or, if this is what the board is agreeing to. <coughs> um, where does that leave us? So, If, if one of the motions is the normal high water line of coastal waters is accurate as determined by the code enforcement officer and as shown in the Northeast Civil Solutions Plan dated March 1st, 2013, and the finding of fact that relates to that is what I've read before, pursuant to 1924 and at the request of the Goldmans, the code enforcement officer made a written determination of the location of the normal high water line adjacent to the tax map U12, lot 70, as set forth in his June 3rd, 2013 letter and as shown on the March 1st, 2013 Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. I think that's mm -hmm. one conclusion and finding that we need to make. Um, sticking with the 2013 order that was remanding it back to us. So that's the um, normal high water line. And then, you know, the next step, next issue that was remanded was assuming that the orna ornamental steps do not violate the setback provision. I think by making this determination, we're making the determination that they do not violate the setback provision. Um, we should probably have that as yes. a conclusion as well. Mm -hmm. um, so what would that read? The ornamental steps do not violate the 75 foot setback. 75 foot setback. Setback provision. What section is that? Nineteen six eleven. Nineteen six eleven A. Eleven A. Okay. Um, so 
obviously the another issue will be does the golden property fall within the shoreline? Um, how much of the golden property falls within the shoreline zone? But before we get to that, should we deal with the the July 2014 remand, which Okay, so the twenty the twenty fourteen remand was were the two issues of A the standing and B challenge of the CEO's boundary location determination. So we're do we need a separate conclusion or finding that we're upholding that, even though we're stating that? I don't think so. No, I think the fact that we're actually hearing, we're sitting here right now hearing it, we accept that they have standing. Also be careful not to get the two boundary locations confused. I, I think what, I think in that remand they mean my 250 shoreline zoning okay. boundary okay. determination. Okay. Yep, boundary of the shoreline zoning district. Okay, so we'll get to that. Um, okay, so the ornamental steps do not violate the 75 foot setback provision as set forth in 19611A. Is the next issue the shoreland zoning district boundaries? What are everybody's thoughts on that? I can speak, I'll let, I'll let some of the attorneys talk about the case law, but I can speak from experience um, as an engineer that typically I can, I can attest to Attorney Costigan's um, statement that I've seen Sherlin's own boundaries measured from a point located on the ground, a line located on the ground by a land surveyor. So, um, in my experience, the zoning maps are, um, are illustrational. They can't be relied on at that scale um, for the purposes of determining a line um, such as a shoreland zone boundary. So I think it's common practice. I mean, so this, this also goes back to 1924, which is the uncertainty. Yes. So, I mean, I think the operative language is where uncertainty exists as the location of any zoning district boundary, the property owner may request in writing, and the code enforcement officer makes a written determination. So, to kind of unpack that, the issue is, um, does uncertainty exist? Is that the first issue that we have to tackle? I think it's clearly uncertain. Uh, the, the boundary. The map. The, ma the map, yes. <laughs> well, the map versus the, the ordinance language. Yeah. That creates the uncertainty. That think, then triggers. I think that by definition, if we're saying that the code enforcement officer has the authority to set the normal high water, high water mark, then that is the, to some, the water line boundary of the shoreland district. So for purposes of measuring the 250, wouldn't that same analysis about the uncertainty piece apply to measure the depth of the district? Do you see what I'm saying? Unless you're going by the map. Yeah. I mean, clear, clearly the... How can you do both of those two things together and have it... How can you measure how the you, setback how, how is that consistent? and say, oh, this is uncertain. We're, we need the code enforcement officer to make a determination of the location of this. But for purposes of the district, we don't. I'm, I'm inclined to agree. I mean, we heard argument. We heard argument contrary to that. But where we can use, you know, one measurement to determine the water side, you know, distances, and we can use another to determine the land side. But, um, I mean, I, 
I personally have just looking at the map and just relying on this troubles me. Um, the overview or the blown up or Well, either. I mean, well, the, the blown the up, it, it, it seems yeah. very imprecise. Well, blowing it up makes it less precise, but it's still, the a line goes, you know, it's not exact. It is not exact. That's what I'm saying. I think we're agreeing. Yes. Right. Okay. Um. And, and I, in my opinion, that's why there's language in section 19611 that defines the shoreline per performance overlay district to all land within 250 feet horizontal distance of the upland edge of a coastal wetland, and so forth. Which, up to this point, we've sort of agreed that that means the normal high water line. In addition, the, the map has pretty much a straight line all along um, Pilot Point Road, but the ledge obviously is not straight. So by definition, there's going to be some spots that are 220, 245 sure. feet, some yeah. 255, and so forth. So you can't go by the map. You need to go by the 250 from the water line, which is very irregular. I was likewise pers persuaded by Attorney Costigan's argument that the ordinance is just as much a legislative act as the zoning map and so to, and one integrates the other meaning the ordinance integrates the zoning map and they work together to define where the boundaries are and you know the language in 1924 is very clear regarding proper how to deal with roads and lot lines and property lines and then with regard to areas that are less certain such as the normal high water line, which has a definition, and then some, you know, it says the code enforcement officer makes a determination in writing when requested to do so. And, and what's the, can you remind me what the language is that specifically refers to the map that, that the Murphys are arguing is control? So, I think those that's are two nice, separate questions. The boundaries of the above districts are as shown on the zoning map. Where the zoning map shows so 1922 and 1923 and four. So they're saying, look, there's this ordinance, there's this map. It's a certified copy. It has to be posted. And then for the location of district boundaries, it says there as on the zoning map. And then there's this ordinance language about them. And then they also cited that summer winds case, which seems somewhat distinguishable. I only breezed through it really quickly, but. Um, in terms of, I didn't see a clear ruling from the law court saying you may not use ordinance language to give context to a zoning map. Just for clarity purposes on the Summerlin case, it's paragraph six that we're talking about. Um, the phrase is, because the official shoreland zoning map is part of Scarborough's local ordinance, the issue of whether the ZBA erred in relying on the map's classification of a particular parcel of land is a matter of interpreting the ordinance. So it's which goes chicken and the egg. Do you say the ordinance interprets the map, or do you say the map interprets the uh, ordinance? I think we all agree that you know, it's part of what we have to consider. Right. It's just there appears to be some ambiguity or some less defined features of the map. Right. We are seeking clarity and purpose for the ordinance. I'd agree. I think this decision is just stating what our ordinance says, which is that, hey, don't forget your zoning map is part of your ordinance, and the two things are both legislative acts that have to be read in conjunction with each other. Right. I'm hearing everybody kind of heading in one direction. Does anybody want to play devil's advocate or feel like the map should control.
Okay. Um, do you want to come up with a more findings of fact or functions? I mean, you know, we've now we've addressed already the normal high water line and the steps not violating the 75 foot setback. So the next issue is the shoreland zone and Ben's June 30th letter, June 3rd letter, 2013. I, mean, I think we could probably phrase this similar to the first one, which is pursuant to 1924 and at the request of the Goldman's. So, pursuant to 1924 and at the request of the Goldman's, the code enforcement officer made a written determination. of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District. Boundary. Boundary. Um, as it relates to tax map U12. U12 plot 70 as set forth in his June 3rd, 2013 letter. And, and uh, what? Yeah, and, and, and as shown on the, this is still the March 1st Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. for that would be to uphold his letter, uphold the determination in his letter. Um, so then the next issue would be the amount of impervious surface on the property. I'd just like to clarify that I, I did go on site the day that they mentioned, but I, I didn't actually measure imper all the impervious surfaces. It was mostly a discussion about what would be measured and how things would be measured. Okay. Um. So what? So we would be relying on uh, on the Mitchell and Associates uh, calculation. Hold on. 
system at this the best information mm -hmm. we have to date. Okay, so um, so there is a professional stamped landscape architect plan that shows the lot coverage. And there has been testimony that that was calculated conservatively. Okay, wait. So to include areas that are, are you? Is this a finding of fact? I'm just talking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just talking about sure. the substantial evidence right. in the record right. regarding this issue right. and summarizing that from my perspective, which is the stamped plan from Mr. Mitchell and the testimony by Attorney Costigan and Mr. Mitchell and Ben that there was discussion um, about what would be measured and that that was done conservatively to include even areas that perhaps might not fall under the technical definition of impervious surface in the ordinance. I agree. Uh, I would only add that I thought that evidence was persuasive. Um, Mr. Mitchell was actually here and he testified. Okay. Um, so, so we would have. Uh, we have to figure out which of these are conclusions and which of these are motions and which of these are just findings of fact. But um, what's this one? This is um, with respect to lock coverage. Calculations were provided by the property owner. Uh, why don't we just refer to this? Yeah. I mean, we should we should refer to this in yeah. finding calculations as in set testimony. forth. Calculations as set forth on the September twenty fourth. 2013 September 24th 2013 stamped plan as well as testimony um, from the professional from what from the certified professional from the certification certified. License. Yeah. the licensed professional from the sorry. licensed professional With respect to lot coverage calculations as set forth in the September 24th, 2013 stamp plan, as well as testimony from the licensed professional. Indicate that the lot coverage is less than 20% impervious surface. coverage calculations the September 24th 2013 stamp plan as well as testimony from the licensed professional indicate that the lot coverage is less than 20% impervious surface I think we've generally hit all of the findings that we um, decision again just to yeah.
the only thing I would I'll ask <clears throat> that I don't think ended up in the findings of fact is that there was a lot of talk about how the, or the interpretation of normal high water line as well as the interpretation of upland edge of a coastal wetland. We didn't, we didn't necessarily make a finding on that. I don't know if we, if we need to. I mean, I think it's in, I mean, Ben's letter, <clears throat> section 19611, this is in Ben's letter, 19611 of the zoning ordinance states the following, the shoreland performance overlay district applies to all land within 250 feet horizontal distance of the normal high water line in Great Pond and Spur River, Spur, Spurwink River, upland edge of coastal wetlands, including all areas affected by tidal action, such as cobble and sand beaches, mud flats and rocky ledges, upland edge of freshwater wetland. The second bullet point applies to the situation, upland edge of coastal wetland, including all areas affected by tidal action, such as cobble and sand beaches, mud flats and rocky ledges. It is my interpretation that this description is the same as the normal high water line of coastal waters. I think that okay. includes everything that we need, um, you know, in terms of the determination. Mm -hmm. so, so that that's a that's a determination of the upland edge of a coastal wetland, which is how you measure the shoreland zone. Is, is, is there also a the question? Decision. Yeah, there's also a page. Of Three to four. Which one? The 2013. Okay. So the Murphys argue that the normal high water line is the top of the bank. Because that's how the ordinance, uh, so the definition in the ordinance is. So on, on the setback issue, the be will need to consider and determine the location of the normal high water line. And that goes back to the okay. definition of normal high water line. Um, so, I mean, this actually might come before, this might be, you know, in terms of the order of things, this might be like the first finding or... But it's the same finding. I mean, that's the kind of circular piece that I was talking about. It's like once we've authorized the... What then? Once we've said that there's a lack of clarity regarding the location of the normal high water line, aren't we then saying that the location of the start of the of the 250 foot zone? Yeah, I mean, I'm just the language on the setback issue. The ZBA will need to consider and determine the location of the normal high water line as that as that term is defined in 1913. So that's the, I mean, the motion, I mean, the motion, I mean, our determination was going to be the normal high water line of coastal waters is accurate as determined by the code enforcement officer and as shown on the Northeast Civil Solutions plan dated March 1st, 2013. Are we, I mean, are we leaving something out? I mean, do we need to basically, do we, do we, do we have to explicitly state that we are making a determination that it is um, not the top of the bank. I have a suggestion. This is from the Mac case. And at the last paragraph, the second to last paragraph, they say the ordinance contemplates some terrain above the high tide level that is still within the effects of the tide. So I'm attracted to the word contemplates some terrain above. That would be consistent with the discretion that's given to the CEO. Right. Okay. I agree. That would be the finding fact. What, what would it be? That I like. Or their the definition of. Or we'd be adopting the, the court's language. Oh, the, the, the ordinance contemplates some terrain, some terrain above the high tide level. Yes. That's still within the effect of the tides. You want that as a. Because if we look at the definition, right. there's an IE, and there's three examples. Yep. It should be EG. So uh, um, that will have to be uh, you know, fixed, attended to, um, and hence the, the finding fact would, would answer that problem. 
temporarily. This order, this 2013 order, also it references the Mac case, and it, it says the Mac case interprets the definitions reference to top of the bank as an example. It's therefore conceivable that the apparent extreme limit of the effects of the tide could fall, could fall short of the top of the bank. And, get, and this is saying it could be above. Above, below. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but this, I mean, so the ordinance contemplates if you wish to get very specific that it uh, is not necessarily at the top of the and you can say even further comma now okay but so i guess my question is are do we are we really do we need a do we need that and that seems like I'll defer to you guys you know i mean we're just we, we have the, the matter before us. There was testimony on, on this particular point. It right. was important to both parties. Uh, it's referenced in the correspondence and the court's decision. We have a, a definition that's fairly specific. Uh, you know, we're trying to understand an ambiguity um, as to the okay. signal so, that they use. So what, what, what's the holding that you propose? The, Thank you for putting me on the spot. The, the or, okay. The, the ordinance contemplates a normal high water line that does that may that may not correspond to the top of the bank. That may be less than the top of the bank, cliff, or beach at high tide. Say the below the three again. I don't have that one in That may be less than the top of the bank. Top of the bank. Okay. I think we all agree that that would be the outer limit, which would be those three items. Right. In the theoretical sense. And that subject to the discretion by the CEO, it's either the mean water level and up from there. Yep. Okay, so the ordinance contemplates a normal high water line that may be less. But it's the upland edge of a coastal wetland, right? Mm -hmm. That we're talking about, right? Say that again? It's the upland edge of a coastal wetland that we're talking about. Oh, uh, we're to well, we're talking about the normal high water line now. Why are we talking about this? Because that's where, the, that's where that, that setback, 75 foot setback applies to. Right, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the 250 feet, which is the upland edge of the coastal wetland. I think we went back because okay, the, 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 it, the one of the issues on the land yeah, was is determine the location of the normal high water line. Which we did in the context of the 75 foot setback. Yes. I guess that's, that's the question, whether or not we need a finding. Do we, do we want more? No, we can move on. And so we should strike that 30? No, I think we do. We can put it But not in the context of the setback, which is the normal high water line. Okay. Right? So you want this in terms of the upland edge? Correct. Okay. Which is separately yep. discussed. And, and I said in my letter that I interpreted them to be one and the same, mm -hmm. to be the same location. Yep. yep. Um, so this would now, the ordinance contemplates a. The ordinance defines. The ordinance defines. The Shoreline Performance Overlay District. As all land within 250 feet horizontal distance. I mean, like, now we're just typing what the ordinance yeah, says. Oops, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get all that? Yep. Of the upland edge of a coastal wetland. The applicable ordinance. Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got the old the one. Ordinance. The ordinance. The applicable ordinance? Well, the old ordinance. The ordinance, the ordinance, the ordinance at the time of this. In effect, uh, in effect, at. The then effective ordinance? 
the ordinance in effect at the time the building permit was issued. Then in effect? Is that too vague? The ordinance in effect at the time. What? At the time of the application? Is that what was that? Sure. It was effective until last month. <laughs> the prior ordinance? I mean, I want to be specific enough that this makes sense. The effective ordinance? The ordinance in effect at the time of the... Until, why don't we say then, until whatever the date is that it's amended. But I don't think this part was amended anyway. Oh. I could be wrong. Does it say on the new one when the 19611 was amended? Yeah. The ordinance in effect until? September 11, 2014. Is that right? Defines the Shoreland Performance Overlay District as all land within 250 feet of horizontal distance of the upland edge of the coastal wetland. Of a coastal wetland, of including. A coastal wetland. wetland? Yep. Including what? All areas affected by tidal action. Affected? A. A. F. F. Yep. Tidal action. Okay. Dot, dot, dot. dot, dot, dot. Right. She's meaning that the tidal action, such as cobble in sand beaches, mud flats, and rocky edges. That's the section. Uh, 135, page 135. That's the dot, dot, dot. Bottom right. <laughs> we totally have I'm tired. The middle bullet. Thanks. Such a Okay. And then we're going straight into the, what was the point of doing that? The code enforcement officer determined that, that, that the upland edge of the coastal wetland, in this instance, was the normal high water line. Code, uh, the code enforcement officer determined, well, I mean, what we're doing is we're upholding that. So should we state that? The board upholds. That's a motion. No, that's not a finding of fact. Okay. Thank you. Um, the code enforcement officer determined. Sorry, that's probably not. Um, so what's? Well, one minute. If I mean, if that's a motion, can we just have that as a motion? Do we have to also then? What? The code enforcement officer determined. Just give me a sec. Um, June 3rd letter says, the second bullet point, which is the one that I just typed, um, applies to the situation, upland edge of coastal wetlands, including all areas affected by tidal action. Um, it is my interpretation that this description is the same as the normal high water line of coastal waters. So there was... <coughs> Um, so the 
argument that the zoning map controls over the more specific meets and bounds description of 250 feet um, was persuasive for me. Right, I agree. So I think that would be the next finding of fact on that coastal wetland. So the coded, okay, how about, so it's. The board found persuasive and the, the sentence that Joanna just mentioned. <laughs> well, I mean, we have pursuant to 1924 and at the request of the Goldman, the code enforcement officer made a written determination of the shoreland performance overlay district boundary as it relates to tax map as set forth in his letter. But we want to be more specific than that. The board order at pages three to four right. asked us to specifically call out a discussion of the coastal wetland right. piece versus. Right. So I thought it was important yep. for us to discuss the substantial evidence on that piece right. as well. Oh, and we have. How are we going to incorporate it into this document? I gave you a document. I did not have it come back to me. This? Which? Okay. I'm not sure where stuck. Sorry. Um, I mean, I think we need link. I mean, on this issue, the ZBA will have to consider the Murphy's argument that the shoreland zoning map is dispositive on that issue where the map is made part of the ordinance. And the contrary argument that section 19.6 is a more specific provision that should control. I, I think we need that. We need a finding that 19.611 is a more specific provision that should control. Right? Yes, I, I think, think that the code enforcement officer's decision integrates the well, zoning no, I, I mean, I know into it, the ordinance I know it does, and then executes that, that integration by appropriately measuring and setting forth what that meets and bounds description is that's set forth in the ordinance as he's required to do under 19. I mean, do you, do you think the reference to his June 3rd letter addresses everything that the court was looking for? Read it to me again, I'm sorry. What am I reading to you? The court? The statement about his letter. Pursuant to 1924 and at the request of the Goldman's, the code enforcement officer made a written determination of the shoreland performance overlay district boundary as it related to tax map U12 lot 70 as set forth in his June 3rd, 2013 letter and as shown on the March 1st, 2013 Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. And what the court is remanding to us is the ZBA will have to consider the Murphy's argument that the shoreland zoning map is dispositive on the issue of where the map where the map is made part of the ordinance and the contrary argument that section 19611 is more specific and should control in the latter case which is what we're doing however the ZBA will have to determine the upland edge of the coastal wetland in front of the golden property including all areas affected by the title <laughs> ordinance 19611 in order in order to determine the 250 foot depth of shoreland zone and how much of the golden properties within that zone for purposes of the impervious surface surface calculation right so is reference to his letter does that get all of that or do we do we need to unpack that in our findings does his letter specifically discuss how the coastal wetland ties into his determination of the normal high water line or does it just de determine the normal high water line does it do both It's a flat statement down at the bottom. The last one? Um, I determined the line to be as it is shown on the Northeast Civil Solutions Plan dated March 1st, 2013. The shoreland performance overlay district is all land within 250 feet of the normal high water line of coastal waters. That's what we need. Cannot just adopt Ben's 
position. Like, you know, um, the, you know, what's the magic that we have to word, use in sentences to describe that that's our conclusion or something similar? Okay. Well, I mean, let's let's use their language, which is. Um, The ZBO will have to consider that Murphy's argument that the shoreland zoning map is dispositive. And the contrary argument that section 19, this is just wrong, section 19, 6, 11 um, controls the determination of. Is more specific than. Is more specific. Is more specific than the well section. <clears throat> with respect to the shoreland performance. Overlay District. Section 19611 is more specific than I don't I'm struggling with this because that's not exactly what I think. I think that the provisions of 19611 and 19.4.2, so the provisions of the shoreland overlay zone and the provisions in the ordinance that say, here's what you do when the districts are unclear, are what for me allows the ordinance, the zoning map to be implemented through the ordinance as it's required to be by 19.2.2. Sorry. <laughs> so I would not just write down the language of the court decision right. because I don't think that that's I'm. No, no. I'm not. I, we need to address. I, I don't. We don't need to use their language, but we need to address their concern. We right. And so, I so would say that what I my read is that the zoning map delineates the rough boundaries of the shoreland performance overlay district the section 1924 sets the process by which the code enforcement officer determines district boundaries when those boundaries are unclear, uncertain. uncertain, and that is how the zoning map is integrated into the ordinance, and both, and those provisions of the zoning map and the zoning ordinance are re were read harmoniously in this instance. Something like that. Um, the zoning map delineates the rough boundaries of the shoreland performance overlay district. Section 1924 sets forth the process by which the CEO determines district boundaries when... Can I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. yeah. Instead of saying it defines the rough boundaries, could we say... Um, that be, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but for me, because of the, the scale of the map, there's uncertainty. Yep. So, mm -hmm. a graphical representation that may not be accurate due to the right. So, the, z the it's zoning. less accurate than an on-site assessment. Okay, I but don't know. Yeah, so or just or like maybe yeah, yeah. Let me the zoning up. map represents the zoning map is or, or the say that again. The, the boundary of the shoreland zoning overlay district 
is uncertain as depicted on the zoning map. The boundary of the shoreland over performance district is uncertain. Uncertain as depicted as depicted on the zoning map. On the zoning map. Right. I mean, do we? That's. I mean, that that is what we're determining. We could. We could add. Well, because well then, of the scale. Of, uh, or, I mean, we don't need to. Okay. I, I would say the boundary of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District is uncertain as depicted on the zoning map. Section 1924 sets forth the process by which the CEO determines district boundaries when those boundaries sets forth the process where uncertainty exists. Sets sets it forth the process by which the CEO determines district boundaries when uncertainty exists. Certain certainty exists. And I mean if we just have that, then can we move? I mean, the, the reference to the June 3rd letter is where he's determining the upland edge of the coastal wetland. Mm -hmm. So I think if we just include that language yes. and then reference to the letter, we're, yes. okay. But I think we should say that that's that determining that the normal high water line and the upland edge of the coastal wetland are one and the same is consistent with those terms as they're used in the ordinance. Um, do you want that before we get to I don't know. Ben's letter? I can't. I think it's it's or is it it's referring okay. back to Ben's letter and saying So actually maybe that's kind of that's after we may yeah, maybe okay, so Ben's letter is pursuant to nineteen two four and at the request of the Goldmans. The code enforcement officer made a written determination of the shoreland performance overlay district boundary as it relate as it relates to tax map U twelve lot seventy as set forth in his June third letter and is shown on the March first, twenty thirteen Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. Then the sorry, I didn't get the mm. what was the it was the um, this determination is determination that the, that the normal high water line normal high water line and the upland edge of a coastal wetland are the same are the same is consistent with the ordinance use and definitions mm -hmm. of those terms with the ordinance use yeah Okay. All right. What? Um, and I think we have most of generally what we need here. Um, what are the motions? The, the proposed motions in this draft are to uphold the code enforcement officer's letter dated June 3rd, 2013, with just uphold the letter. Um, also, the normal high water line of coastal waters is accurate as determined by the CEO and is shown in the Northeast Civil Solutions Plan dated March 30th. Um, I mean, the overall motion is to grant than um, the Murphy's appeal. I just need help determining what. Sorry, can you restate what the overall position is? Which one? The, the overall one, I mean, I why we're here is to grant the Murphy's appeal. It is? Well, I mean, it's, <laughs> but that's, it, we're not going to grant the Murphy's I mean, I guess the motion could be to deny. Do you do a motion to deny or do we? Didn't you say that backwards? 
I, I'm sure I did. I think so. Well, that, this, this is the way it was written in the draft. The to grant the, the draft Murphy's appeal, vote, oh, vote, okay. vote yes or no. Oh, I see. Okay. That seems but confusing it, given but, our but findings. But the, mo uh, the motion is going to be to deny. Potentially. Potentially, yes. Um, the Murphy's appeal. That's the overall motion. So, before we get to the motion, did we talk in the findings of fact about the 20% and that there is a, that reference document? Um, Oh. Yes. Okay. Thank we, you. Uh, with respect to law coverage calculations, the September 24th, 2013 stamp plan, as well as testimony from the licensed professional, indicate that the law coverage is less than 20% in previous service. Okay. Do we want to address anything about the remedy? That's not, not our goal on this one. Not our goal, but moving on. Okay. Um, Should we make a motion? I mean, I mean, I think the motion that somebody's going to make is to deny the appeal. But, but and, and my only kind of confusion here comes from there's a couple other motions that are proposed in here. Maybe Ben you can explain why. In other words, I mean, ordinarily, in a, in a less complex yeah. uh, case, there's just, you know, deny, you know, uh, to grant or deny, and then we have a number of conclusions and finding the fact. Yeah, you, you, you've covered the proposed motions in this draft. You've, you've covered them in, in, what, our in, in what you've written. Conclusions here. and findings of fact. Yeah. So there's one motion, one findings of fact. Well, I mean, there's going to be a number of findings. I think, yeah. But essentially, we're, we're, everything's grouped together, and we're just going to go at it. I think. Okay. Um, let me read what I have bef just before we, because I, I, I was typing and I don't know if, if we want all of this in here. I'm just going to read it and um, just shout out comments. <clears throat> I think some of the stuff we want to remove. but. The code enforcement officer has the authority under section 1924 of the zoning ordinance to assess the normal high water line. I think that's just stating the ordinance. I'm not sure we need that. Yes. Um, where uncertainty exists as to the location of any zoning district boundary and at the request of a property owner. Okay, that we've already incorporated, so I don't think we're going to want that. All right. Um, Pursuant to 1924, and at the request of the Goldmans, the code enforcement officer made a written determination of the location of the normal high water line adjacent to tax map U12, lot 70, as set forth in his June 3, 2013 letter, and as shown on the March 1, 2013 Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. The normal high water line of coastal waters is accurate as determined by the code enforcement officer, and as shown on the Northeast Civil Solutions Plan dated March 1, 2013. The ornamental steps do not violate the 75-foot setback provision as set forth in 19611A. The ordinance in effect until September 11, 2014 defines the Shoreland Performance Overlay District as all land within 250 feet horizontal distance of the upland edge of a coastal wetland, including all areas affected by tidal actions such as coral and sand beaches, mudflats, and rocky ledges. The boundary of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District is uncertain as depicted on the zoning map. Section 1924 sets forth the process by which the CEO determines district boundaries when uncertainty exists. Pursuant to 1924, at the request of the Goldmans, the Code Enforcement Officer made a written determination of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District boundary as it relates to tax map U12, lot 70, as set forth in its June 3, 2013 letter and as shown in the March 1, 2013 Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. Is that a duplicate? Didn't. No, because okay. that's the shoreland district overlay gotcha. versus the okay. his determination that the normal high water line and the upland edge of the coastal wetlands are the same is consistent with the ordinance use and definition of those terms um, then we have uphold the shoreland 
Um, Where's the twenty percent stuff? That's coming. Uh, I just have another. This was a motion. I don't think we're going to call it a motion, but this was. I had a paragraph here. Uphold the Shoreland Performance Overlay District Boundary, as set forth. This will just be we uphold we uphold the shoreland performance overly district boundary as set forth in the code enforcement officer's letter dated june 3rd 2013 and as shown in the march 1st 2013 northeast civil solutions survey with respect to lot coverage calculations the september 24th 2013 stamp plan as well as testimony from the licensed professional indicate that the lot coverage is less than 20 percent impervious surface shouldn't those be two separate things should the first one be like a motion and the second one be the finding of fact? That's why I was reading all of this to determine how, where, where this should all be. Was that two sentences? Was what two sentences? What you just read, that last bit. Well, there was the we uphold. Right. And then with respect to the lot coverage calculations. Yeah. So shouldn't the with respect to go before and then the other one, the we uphold be a motion? Well, that would be so we're doing separate motions in terms, I mean, there's... Oh. You could just delete it and wait for an actual motion. Okay. The we uphold part, I'll just delete yeah. that. Somebody's going to make a motion. All right. In theory. I'm going to delete that language. We're never going to go back. You might want to just cut it so you can paste it back later. All right. Um, somebody like to make a motion? We uphold. I mean, are we, are we, is there going to be one motion to deny the appeal and then we're going to incorporate all of these as findings and conclusions? Or do we want, you know, a motion to deny the appeal and then a motion with respect to high water line and then a motion with respect to the shoreland overlay? I, I prefer a single motion. Just to okay. Except technically it's two separate appeals. So you might want to keep the one about so the letter. The, the separate appeals are the the uh, the appeal of my your letter. letter. Yeah, because that's a separate yeah. appeal. So I think one one for that, and then one overall. We have to separate the findings of fact. Okay. Um, We could just do one and incorporate them all by reference into the second motion. Okay. I do one mo say that again. Two motions. Right. For the findings of fact for the second motion, just incorporate all the findings of fact above. Even if some won't apply. Do you want to spend an hour figuring no, out which ones no, go with which one? Um, were we were we including were we including findings of fact that where uncertainty exists as the location of any zoning district boundary and at the request of the property owner section nineteen two four of the zoning ordinance permits the code enforce no, that wasn't even complete. Um, so should somebody make a motion? Would this be on the code enforcement officer letter? That motion? Or it could be. Somebody has to start somewhere. I mean, the, I mean, we have a draft motion. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to uphold the code enforcement officer's letter dated June 3rd, 2014. Um, 
that's the, I mean, the, the appeal was of this letter. Yes. Right? Okay. I mean, I think that's clear. I mean, if, if the appeal, they were appealing the letter, the determination set forth in the letter, or we're upholding the letter. Um, does anybody second that motion? I will. Any discussion on that motion? All in favor of that motion? All right. That's so the other appeal is the building appeal. current 130056. Sadly, I don't know whose permit that was. Wait. That was, that's got to be Bruce Smith's one in 2012, right? This is the other one. This is the one on my letter. Okay. The CEO's determination of the shoreline performance early district is inconsistent. I mean, we've, we've now just upheld your letter. Yeah. I think, I think we covered it. Just wanted to show that. To yeah. You. Um, That one, does that building permit just go to the setback? I just, I mean, I, I, given the choice, what I would have preferred for that motion would have been a motion to uphold the CEO's determination of the shoreland performance overlay district boundary as set forth in his June 3rd, 2013 letter. So you want to make another motion and retract the first? You have to do it, Mike has to do it. Who has to I do can it? do that. If you want. I think the person that made the motion has to do it. Okay. But I could be wrong about that. I retract the previous motion. Can I move to second? retract my earlier motion that was approved. I'd like to <laughs> I move to retract my previous motion <laughs> that was approved. Right, so we have a second. I second that. Mm -hmm. All in favor. <laughs> okay. Motion to uphold the Code Enforcement Officer's determination of the Shoreland Performance Relay District Boundary as set forth in his June 3rd letter dated. What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm sorry. I just, I wanted that motion to incorporate what that letter was about. I know, but then what's our other motion going to say? We'll get there. Well, we kind of should be taught, we should have some more discussion well, about I mean, how it, those are going to play nicely together. So, I mean, that's the determination. So, in 2012, Bruce Smith determined in building permit whatever the normal high water line. In 2013, Ben issued a formal determination regarding the location of the normal high water line. Which is subject to the appeal. Correct. Right. Both were. But their determinations about the location of the normal high water line were different. Right. And in that same letter, Ben located the upland edge of the coastal wetland. Right. So I guess what I'm asking is, if we're upholding Ben's letter as it applies to the normal oh, water right. line, are, are we by definition overturning? No. no. Okay. No, because I, I think my letter, my letter still works with Bruce's permit. Okay. And because either way, they're not the, within 75 feet. Right. Either, with with either determination, they're not within 75. And the court asked us to do de novo, which means I am able to go out and gather evidence and bring it back for you guys. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Never mind. But, I mean, this is just, this first part is just with respect to the overlay district, not the high water mark, the 75 feet. Right? Why? I, I, well, because. The, the grievance, the, 
is the CE, this, the nature of the agreement is the CEO's determination of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District boundary is inconsistent with the zoning ordinance and the zoning map and past practices of the town. That was the appeal. Yeah, that was the secondary appeal. Okay. That's kind of the standalone appeal other than the, the denial of, I mean, what we will be presumably denying. So Ben's 20, I'm sorry. It's okay, no. I'm, I'm just not seeing how they're separate. Ben's 2013 letter said, here's where the normal high water line is. Because, because it's I'm, also the coastal wetland, upland edge. Right. They're the same thing. So how do we then say that that letter is only pertaining to one no, thing and not the other? I just, the appeal was with respect to the zone. Presumably they were appealing Ben's determination. I don't think they were happy about the location of the 75 foot no, no, setback I, line not. either. Right. And we have to, we're doing both. I mean, in light of the remand, the court uh, on the setback issue of the ZBA will need to consider and determine the set. Okay, I mean, we're doing both. And they're both covered in this letter. So should we take out the language that I just added? I don't know. What <laughs> did you just add? I don't know. Mo motion to uphold the CEO's determination of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District boundary as set forth in his letter dated June 3rd, 2013. I should think that's fine. But then we're going to have to write the same sentence, but substitute in the normal high water line um, as a second motion, right? I mean, we were kind of handling those separately in, in, our, in our facts. I mean, what we could just do is go back to just motion to uphold the letter and then unpack it in the you know, findings. I think we should just reference his 2013 decision or okay. determination or something like that. Which is, OK, I'm sorry, because I, I went back to this. Motion to uphold the code enforcement officer's letter, letter dated June 3rd, 2013. I don't think it should just be a letter. I think it should be his decision or his determination or something. You know. His, I mean, there were. Motion to uphold the code enforcement officer's. Written motion to uphold the code enforcement officer's written determination regarding there you go. the location of the shoreland performance overlay district and and the normal high water line. Second. What? Second. Second. I'm seconding. Well, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and the normal high water line of coastal waters as set forth in his <clears throat> motion to uphold the code enforcement officer's determination, sorry, written determination regarding the location of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District and the normal high water line of coastal waters as set forth in his letter dated June 3rd, 2013. Somebody like to make that motion or a So I moved. I second that. All in favor? All right. Um, do we have another motion to deny the Murphy's appeal? Or is I think so. 
question? Well, yeah, because this was the. I think so. Did you so move that one? <laughs> what am I so moving? <laughs> huh. Motion to deny the Murphy's appeal. Done. Somebody second? Second. All in favor? All right. Um, so these will be the findings of fact. One, pursuant to... Um, 1924, at the request of the Goldmans, the code enforcement officer made a written determination of the location of the normal high water line adjacent to tax map U12, lot 70, as set forth in his June 3, 2013 letter, and as shown in the March 1, 2013 Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. Sorry, Josh. Yep. Do, do, do you want to incorporate oh. te technically? Yeah, yeah. Okay. all right. <coughs> Findings of fact, one. Um, Maynard and Deborah Murphy own the property at 24 Pilot Point Road, and they reside there. The Murphy's property is almost directly across the street from the subject property. Two, on August 17th, 2012, Pilot Point LLC filed an application for a building permit with the code enforcement officer seeking a permit for construction of a new accessory structure at 27 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 70. Three, <clears throat> On August 17, 2012, the code enforcement officer issued building permit 130036 for construction of a new accessory structure at 27 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 70. Four, on September 17, 2012, the Murphys filed with the code enforcement officer an appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals challenging the issuance of building permit 130036. Five, based on the Superior Court decision dated July 30, 2014, Maynard and Deborah Murphy have standing to appeal building permit 130036. Six. Pursuant to um, um, 19 19 2 4, at the request of, is this, should this be Pilot Point LLC, not the Goldman's? Are they the party in interest? The property owner is the Pilot Point LLC. It's Pilot Point LLC. At the request is and it was at the request of Yeah. I could, I could pull her letter. The owner of twenty seven Pilot Point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pursuant to 1924, at the request of the owner of 27, 27 Pilot Point Road, the code enforcement officer made a written determination of the location of the normal high water line adjacent to um, the tax map U12, Lot 70, as set forth in his June 3, 2013 letter, and as shown on the March 1, 2013 Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. Two. The ornamental steps do not violate the 75-foot setback provision as set forth in 19611A. I'm sorry, that's sevens. Eight. The ordinance in effect until September 11th, 2014 defines the Shoreland Performance Overlay District as all land within 250 feet horizontal distance of the upland edge of a coastal wetland including all areas affected by tidal action such as cobble and sand beaches, mud, flat, mud flats, and rocky ledges. Nine, the boundary of the shoreland performance overlay district is uncertain as depicted on the zoning map. Section 19-2-4 sets forth the process by which the CEO determines district boundaries when uncertainty exists. Ten. Pursuant to 19-2-4, and at the request of the owners of 27 Pilot Point Road, the code enforcement officer made a written determination of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District boundary as it relates to tax map U12, lot 70, as set forth in his June 3, 2013 letter, 
and as shown on the March 1st, 2013 Northeast Civil Solutions Survey. 11. Is determination that the normal high water line and the upland edge of the coastal wetlands are the same is consistent with the ordinance use and definition of those terms. Josh, can you change the word his to um, CEO? CEO. Thank you. So that 11 should read the CEO's determination that the normal high water line and the upland edge of the coastal wetland are the same is consistent with the ordinance use and definition of those terms. 12, with respect to lot coverage calculations, the September 24th, 2013 stamp plan, as well as testimony from the licensed professional indicate that the lot coverage is less than 20% impervious surface. That's all I have. Are there any others? All in favor of those findings of fact? Six nothing. Thank you for your patience. Uh, move to adjourn.